Welcome to the City Council's May 28th Special City Council Meeting. This is a teleconference meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating remotely to ensure proper social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. We'll start off with roll call. I would like to introduce staff and City Council members present, Vice Mayor Drew Combs, City Council Member Kat Carlton, City Council Member Betsy Nash, City Council Member Ray Mueller. Staff present include our City Manager, Starla Jerome Robinson, Interim City Attorney, Cara Silver, and our City Clerk, Judy Heron. Ms. Heron, would you like to provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Thank you, Mayor Taylor, and again, welcome everyone. For the City Council, we ask that you remain on screen for the duration of the meeting, controlling your own webcam and microphones. Staff will uh, engage their webcams and microphones for presentations and to answer any questions the City Council may have. For members of the public for participating um, in public comment when called for by the Mayor, we will ask that you use the hand feature in the top right of your screen. That will allow you to raise a hand and uh, let us know that you have a public comment on the item. We will open your microphone. You may address the City Council at that time. Uh, and that is it for me. And Mary Taylor, back to you. Thank you, Ms. Heron. The next item on the agenda is regular business. Under regular business, the City Council considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require City Council approval. Item C1, adoption of uncodified urgency ordinance number 1069, extending temporary moratorium on eviction for non-payment of rent by small business commercial tenants directly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. To introduce this item is our interim city attorney, Ms. Cara Silver. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Can you all hear me? So Cara Silver, Interim City Attorney. Um, on April 14th, the city adopted a commercial eviction moratorium ordinance, which was applicable to small businesses, which were, was defined as a business um, earning an annual gross receipts of under $2.5 million. Um, and it, there was a two-part test for applicability. Um, you had to be a small business, and also um, you um, a, a were, would be affected by um, an inability to pay rent due to a COVID-related um, reason. So this ordinance was modeled after the county ordinance, and um, it, like the county ordinance, it expires on March 30, or excuse me, May 31st. And just recently, the county extended their ordinance to June 30th. And so the ordinance before you um, is to align with the county's recent extension. So it would um, extend the city's ordinance to June 30th as well. We have been in communication with the chamber. Uh, the chamber does support this extension. Um, we also know that there are some other counties that have done a similar extension. We know that the city of San Mateo um, recently did a similar extension. Um, and at this point, though, we are not aware of other cities who, who have um, done this extension. It's been primarily counties who have been taking this action. And that um, concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Silver. Are there any clarifying question, questions from the City Council? Council Member Carlton. Do we know um, if this has actually been used by anyone at this point? Thank you. So we do believe that um, it has been used by tenants. The um, John Passman, the economic development uh, coordinator here, has received um, a number of calls from tenants. Um, interestingly, you will recall that the city 
um, included a special waiver request from um, that was um, applicable to landlords. So if the landlord was having a, a COVID-related uh, economic hardship, they could um, essentially file for a waiver of this ordinance with the city manager. We have not received um, a hardship waiver from landlords, but we do believe that tenants are in fact um, exercising their rights under this ordinance. Okay, have the landlords been made aware of the fact that they can uh, come to us if they're having a problem? Yes, they have. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. At this time, um, Ms. Heron, can you call for public comment? Thank you, Mayor Taylor. So for those of you who are just joining, we are on item C1 regarding ordinance 1069, extending temporary moratorium on eviction for non-payment of rent by small business commercial tenants directly impacted by COVID-19. If you have a public comment on this item, please engage that hand feature in the top right of your screen. This will alert us that you have a public comment on this item, and we will engage your microphone and allow you to address the City Council. And Mayor Taylor, I am seeing no raised hands at this time. Thank you, Ms. Heron. So at this time, we'll open it up for council discussion. Council Member Mueller. I actually do have a question for the city attorney. Uh, well, the last time we did this, the judicial council had already put in place a moratorium on evictions until 30 days after the California COVID-19 state of emergency. I think it was, they said there was gonna be 90 days afterwards and then they would allow it to begin. My question is, do you, has that been updated? What is the timing around the Judicial Council moratorium on evictions? So I, I, I believe that it's still in effect in that there cannot be any judicial actions filed I don't know if they have extended um, the time period on that, and I don't. So I don't know when it actually expires. But currently, you cannot legally file um, an unlawful detainer action. I'm just yeah. I'm just wondering. But yeah, I'm wondering the interplay between what we do and that, because in doing this the last time, it's like well, they wouldn't be able to file anything with the state anyway. So it was. Uh, a minimum minimum impact. Um, so, okay, I'll just uh, I'll pass to Betsy and just do some quick research. <laughs> Councilmember Nash. So I was just going to go ahead and move to extend the temporary moratorium. Um, Thank you. I have a motion by. City Council Member Nash and a second by City Mount Council Member Carlton. Call vote. Council Member Carlton? Aye. Council Member Mueller? Uh, sure, I will go ahead and vote yes, but uh, just in the future, I would like before we call the vote, like actually a uh, question if there's any more discussion from the council, uh, but sure, yes. Thank you. Vice Mayor Combs? Yes. And Mayor Taylor? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. The next item on regular business is to provide direction on budget balancing measures, including program and service reductions for city managers proposed fiscal year 2020-2021 budget. This item is continued from May 26th meeting. And to introduce this item is our assistant city manager, Nick Pagueros. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Nick Pagueros. I'm the assistant city manager. 
Uh, Mr. Dan Jacobson, our Assistant Administrative Services Director, will be walking the Council through uh, the uh, continued discussion of budget reductions for the 2020-21 fiscal year, as well as uh, options for uh, use of one-time money and or revenues to close the anticipated revenue shortfall. Uh, we're recommending the Council start with the items that were continued for discussion uh, today and uh, then move on to the discussion of one-time money and revenues um, and then finally to the table 17 and fit, uh, uh, 16 that were provided to you um, in the in the packet. Uh, I want to thank the Council for its patience through this process. Uh, there are this is an iterative process and uh, that I think it will be quite evident as we go through the list today. Um, we've updated the list to group the uh, reductions by department, so hopefully that will streamline the uh, review of those reductions and the department heads are here to answer questions on those. So with that, I'll pass it off to uh, uh, Mr. Jacobson. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. Um, just to start out the discussion, I uh, want to note that we don't have a presentation given that uh, you have seen the presentation several times at this point. Um, so we're planning to largely go off of the uh, items which were provided in the attachment to the continued staff report. Um, just by way of sort of some administrative notes, uh, as Mr. Pekaris mentioned, uh, the um, items are all grouped by what staff understood the City Council to desire for either keeping items on the list to be incorporated into the proposed budget, removing items from the list, uh, discussion items to be continued, and those options of one-time money or revenue to close any deficits if they exist after identifying which items to incorporate into the City Manager's proposed budget. Um, just to verify what we are looking for in terms of direction here, staff does request that Council confirms consensus on budget balancing measures to include in the City Manager's fiscal year 2020-21 proposed budget and authorize issuance of notice to intent notice of intent to lay off those employees providing those services impacted by reductions. Of note there, layoffs will not be finalized with this authorization, um, given that there is a, a layoff period and the council has not yet at this point adopted a budget. So with that, um, what I can do is I can either display uh, all of the items on the screen if council desires, um, I can move to them, um, or I, uh, so whichever council desires, I can either display them or not, given that um, they it is a very long list and somewhat difficult to see on the screen. Um, just by note of another housekeeping item, I will try to largely remain off the screen during the council's discussion in order to allow the webcam use so that uh, the city's department heads as a subject matter experts can come on and answer any of city council's questions. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Are there um, any follow-up questions before Mr. Jacobson leaves the screen? Um, since we're starting off with, you suggested with table 18, um, what we stated on Tuesday that we wanted it to follow up in a discussion. Um, and on the first page, uh, the majority of the items on here are related to the police department. Um, and just going back to some of the discussion on Tuesday night, um, I support Vice Mayor Cohn's suggestion about looking at this holistically. Uh, it's hard to make recommendations um, when we're piecemealing um, a department. So I didn't know if there any other follow-up on that item or if there were some items on this list of two, page C2.10, there are any items on here that any of the council is adamant about removing, actually cutting. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, I had um, a question um, about sort of 167 and then 168. So, um, are they sort of necessary to go together, right? And so if we're going to have proactive um, nighttime parking enforcement, don't you also have to have the ability for people to um, to get overnight parking permits? 
can can those be separated as as they ha are here? Good evening, Council. Uh, Council Member Combs, Combs, would you like me to answer that question? Yeah, sure. So the the issue is is the cuts would be to do two different services. Obviously, if you're not if you're not enforcing overnight parking, then there's no reason to have overnight parking passes uh, sold. But the the cut the, the the proposed cuts would be to the parking enforcement itself, but also to the uh, records division, which is the who is responsible for actually selling the parking permits, if that makes sense. Yeah, so my only question that like sort of if we if we remove 167 from the list, right? And so that means we you know proactive parking enforcement at night is not suspended, it is ongoing. Then by the very nature, does then at least some part of 168 gets pulled into that? Um, That's that's correct for the the, the one-time parking per, that per, parking permits. That's correct. Okay. It's hard. It's hard to separate it out, honestly. Okay, but just so from, if we go, if if 167 gets removed, then 168 also has to get removed, right? From from a logical perspective. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. Council Member Nash. So I guess my question is, um, does the, so right now 168 says reduce police records by 40%, suspend overnight parking permit sales. Sort of continuing what Count, uh, Vice Mayor Combs was talking about, um, is reducing police records by 40% necessarily tied with suspending overnight parking permit sales? And also, do we not now do that online? So sort of continuing along this line of thought, what actually needs to stay if we want to continue the proactive parking enforcement? So the parking, what would happen is if, if the overnight parking, uh, uh, if, if records was affected, they're the ones who actually sell the overnight parking uh, during the day. Um, electronically, what they what people do is they order them online and, and they're they're mailed out by records. Um, but people could also walk in uh, to the to, to the police department to to buy those overnight parking permits. So if there's um, so we definitely want to be able to sell overnight parking permits with the proactive parking enforcement. Can can people do it online and just pick it up? I, I guess is there any way to further reduce number one sixty six or is that just I, I'm sorry one sixty eight or is that just we need to take that as a whole package? Is there any way to bifurcate that at all? Well, um, it, it's part of the records duty. So with the whole point of the cut would be one records person would no longer be there so there'd be less time and and ability for the other records folks who are doing other other jobs jobs that are required by law to to, to uh, uh send stats to the state to the federal government to respond to pras etc to do the, the the type of work that would need to be done how many um how many overnight parking permits are sold in whatever time period you want to you can tell right. us yeah, I, I don't. I don't know the answer to that I could. I could find out and let you know. Thank you, Councilmember Carlton. Yeah, I was one of the people that lobbied really hard to have this online because it seems silly to have a person uh, there doing this. And when I found out this is the way it was implemented, I was very disappointed. The, the idea is that it should be online, you should be able to get it, it and you should be able to down, print it, download it and print it. I can get tickets for concerts. I can get VIP passes to events. I can buy all kinds of things online and print them up at home. There's, I don't understand why this can't be done. It, it should have been done so that the person wasn't needed to mail it out in the first place. Um, so whether or not we have a budget crisis or whether or not we're just making good fiscal decisions, this needs to be fixed so that people can just get the permit 
and, and not have to depend on an individual putting it in an envelope and snail mailing it out to people. That's, that's really not helpful. That's, that's not, sorry, that's not why, uh, what we were looking for when we put these things online. It was supposed to make it easier for people, not making people wait a week. Uh, how how the, can you do that? Well, the, the, there's a lot of moving parts what, with the enforcement and the issuance of these permits. And it's an IT issue with what kind of permitting uh, software that we have to get that's going to be, uh, that is going to work with the handheld uh, uh, citation machines. I know there was an effort by IT. Uh, it's not complete yet because they wanted to get an entire city permitting or, or uh, system to be able to do this yeah. online. So it's not, it's not complete yet. The, that 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 entire program is not complete yet. I've been begging for this for seven years. For seven years, we could have had so many people that we don't need to to have doing the manual labor and or freeing up some of the super intelligent people that we have to do more critical work. Um, I'm I'm beyond frustrated that finally I was told this was this was coming up and running and. I don't need to say more. You, you see where I'm going with this. I'm, I, I don't know what to do to make this get fixed other than say we need to we need to stop and take a, a, a glaring look. And in a way, it's it's interesting that we're in a point of time where these details come up and where we can really see in an illustrated way. I, I believe it was, uh, God, what was it? Was it Philadelphia, I think? actually documented how much time their admin took. Uh, take, I think it was just in their HR department. And they put so much of it online and they freed up one full-time staff person uh, just being able to put the thing online. Um, and that's there's no reason why we can't do that. That's It's a waste of time and money putting together some kind of an online system that then still requires a full-time person to deal with it. Anyway, that's that's it's a conversation for for another time, but I'm I'm very disappointed in this. Councilmember Mueller, you're on mute. Yeah, so I look at this right now uh, with respect to the department, and the only uh, other thing that I can really see uh, staying on the list. And, I'm, and I know that you guys that there may be pushback on it be the uh, eliminate enhancements to open data and crime analysis just because it's something that's new. Um, it's an enhancement, but the rest of it, I just, you know, it's basically a public safety effort that I, th you know, we might, you mean, you might take code enforcement efforts actually and move that to being reactive as opposed to proactive, but the rest of it I really can't seem cut into. Um, I mean, take the rest, but I can't really see staying on the list. The one thing I do want to say, and uh, I, it's a reflection. I, uh, hopefully, uh, the the respect that I have for the chief that he would understand this uh, means saying this. That's not a reflection on the department or command staff at all. But uh, with a with the deficit of the level that we have right now, I do actually. I I don't think it's uh, a negative thing to go ahead uh, and respond to what we're hearing in the public asking about what do services cost if they were provided for by the county. I don't support doing that right now. I've been on council, uh, I've been on council seven and a half years. I've never asked that question. So I think it's disingenuous for me to say I support doing that at this moment. But I also, uh, I also do feel that in the crisis we have right now, having all the information and looking at that information and making a decision after looking at that information is something that I think uh, it insulates and actually uh, and actually builds trust in government. Uh, at a time like this right now, when you have so much uncertainty with the future is, um, for people to understand that you've looked at all of those all alternatives and you've weighed them and you've looked at the different levels in service and you've gone to them and you said, I, you know, I, I went through the analysis and, you know, having gone through the analysis, all my initial assumptions were correct. Then there's weight behind behind that statement. 
So, um, and I can say that, I can say that, uh, and hopefully the chief, uh, and I, I actually, I don't even say hopefully, my my expectation and belief is the chief takes that uh, with the, the highest level of integrity that he has and says, and isn't threatened by that at all. So um, I would actually, say, you know, in in my discussions, uh, I reached out, found out that if we were to ask the county to sort of give us an idea of what their services cost, they could do that in about two weeks time and respond different levels of service and what that looks like. And candidly, I don't think in this process that, uh, that you know, knowing my colleagues and knowing where everything is that a whole, a whole lot would change, but having the information is something that I think people would ask us, sort of expect us to have. Uh, so, uh, so with that, I, I'll leave that there, but um, if there's support for doing that, you guys can speak up and if there's not, then I'm not gonna beat a dead horse on it. I'll leave it, I'll leave it lie. Um, but I do think that with this, um, the only two other things that I could see possibly even leaving on the list would be 169 or 173. Vice Mayor Combs. Um, yeah, I, I forgot what I was going to say, so you can go to Council Member Carlton. <laughs> Council Member Carlton. Um, I, I agree with uh, Council Member Mueller that uh, a lot of this uh, while in the ideal scenario would would be good to do proactively, but I don't think we necessarily need to do. I've looked into it in places like Los Altos. Uh, I have gone to Los Altos uh, many times for different shops that we don't have, like knitting, and uh, they really don't have a, a problem uh, with parking. Uh, Sometimes she, it's about the same as, as what we have, but I found out they don't proactively uh, uh, give tickets like Menlo Park does. If there's a problem, if a car is parked there to where it's irritating someone, they can call in and get a ticket. So my I have a question for uh, Chief Bertini, if he can come back. So Chief, uh, I agree that we can cut these things. Um, I think code enforcements, um, I think that could be reactive in the sense that I, I don't think that pe police force necessarily drives around eyeballing people's fences to say, actually, I know for a fact they don't because we have so many fences that are, are over lines and, and different things. I, I just wanted to make sure that we're not talking about completely getting rid of investigations and gang and narcotic. We're talking about the proactive things. Uh, so in the, in the reactive sense, um, you will still have police on board to, to handle this. Are you speaking of code enforcement or investigations? Both. Well, the, a so, lot of these are, are, it's no longer proactive, it's reactive. So if somebody's parked uh, a, a car in front of my house for days, I can call the police. That, that there's still policemen available to be reactive, I guess is my question. So, okay, let's let's talk about code enforcement first then. Um, and in and, and code enforcement, uh, as I stated, I think on Tuesday night, there was a enhancement uh, a year, year and a half ago where we actually went uh, and, and were authorized to hire a second code enforcement officer to try to go from reactive code enforcement to proactive. And again, just so everybody's clear, uh, code enforcement officers are not sworn officers. They are civilians uh, who do code enforcement type duties right. um, so we so we did in fact have to, so we do in fact have two uh, right now so if the uh, the cut was made we would uh, there would be a layoff of one of those code enforcement officers and we would go back to only having one code enforcement officer which would make the entire uh, code enforcement effort to be very very reactive in other words uh, uh, we would have to just wait for uh, calls to come in as opposed to proactively going out and dealing with obvious you know co code enforcement uh, uh, issues. Okay, because I, don't a lot wanna, of these, I know ahead. we have a lot of things to go through, so I don't want to get, I don't want to go down a wormhole of spending 40 minutes talking about one thing, but I just wanted to understand, code enforcement, give me an example of a, a proactive code enforcement. Uh, going out and, and seeing, you know, uh, a vehicle parked uh, in, a, in a backyard, uh, going out and seeing weeds over, over a fence, uh, going out and, and um, uh, uh, seeing uh, some kind of code enforcement issue having to do with a, uh, uh, a garage, an illegal uh, conversion of a garage, 
Um, those are the type of things that uh, would be uh, more proactive as opposed to reactive, abandoned vehicles, uh, et okay. cetera. All right, so um, I, I am supporting uh, Council Member Mueller in the sense I'm sad that we couldn't have come with the deal where uh, we had more flexibility financially with the, the police. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if we vote to cut these things, we're, we're not getting rid of this department. We're just doing it reactively rather than proactively. Sorry, I see Betsy has her hand up, so I'll, I'll let ben, uh, Betsy speak. Sorry, Council, Council Member Nash. That's okay. Council Member Nash. No, I, I am actually following on with what you're talking about. Um, I guess two questions. First of all, with code enforcement, um, is one per when you had one person in code enforcement, was that sufficient or so was the reason I'm, I guess I'm concerned with the city, the size we are, that one person is going to be, um, it is going to be difficult even in a reactive mode. And um, just what we are doing to hamper what we're doing there. And can, um, if we were to cut that, can um, a sworn police officer, in fact, do code enforcement in a reactive way if we exceed the, um, if there's a need? So in answer to your first question, the reason why we we, we uh, went for authorization of a second code enforcement officer is because we were getting, city council was getting complaints about code issues not being handled because we didn't have enough personnel to do it. Um, yeah. In answer to your second question, code enforcement issues, they run the gamut from very simple, an abandoned vehicle, to extremely complicated and require a lot of not only knowledge and training, but they have to have knowledge of building building codes, fire codes, and we would have to have a, a police officer basically specially trained to that, and they would be uh, uh, taken off of patrol to do code enforcement. Um, and it's it is makes more a sense monetarily to have a civilian do it because you're, you're going to pay a civilian less than a, a, an actual police officer doing these. They're also very long. The, these these processes take sometimes months. And require numerous uh, communication, legal communication with the with the the violator, et cetera. So it's these are not simple processes that could be done. Thank you. Um, and then my other question is on um, basically in going through the budget, we have been looking at positions that are open that they're vacant right now. And I see on um, number 168 and 170. So right now it looks like the opening, there is a vacancy currently um, for police records, uh, number 168. And there also looks like there's a vacancy for the 170 um, for the narcotics uh, proactive investigations, um, including gang and narcotics. Could you please speak to both of those and um, what it would be if we were to take away the vacancy what that would um, what that would mean? Sure. So we, we have, there there are several vacancies in the police department. Um, we haven't been full staff as long as I've been there uh, that have been baked into this all these all these um, uh, different situations. Uh, we have the the uh, four officers uh, vacant. Um, we have uh, the own overnight parking folk uh, person is, is vacant. We have one records position that's vacant and one dispatcher that's vacant. So in in Cutting the programs, what, what we had to do is we had to look at each line separately and say, could we take a vacancy and apply it to if we were to take a body out of this unit and put that person back into patrol? Uh, so basically, without filling that unit, that uh, that body, that means there's one less personnel in that unit if it's if you're speaking of dis, uh, detectives. So how long has the um, taking the police records? How long has that vacancy been? How long has that position been open in police records? About six months. And what has the impact just been well, of having that vacancy? Right. It, it's it's hard to it's hard to establish now because of the COVID nineteen and they're they're actually working from home. So and we don't have the the, mm -hmm. the, the level of, of work that would normally happen during normal times. Um, but the one of the things that records is required to do is process all of the information that comes to them, uh, whether it's police reports, crimes, um, a st a statistics for uh, for citations, everything that goes to court has to go through records. So it, what it does is it just increases the workload on the other uh, records uh, uh, folks and and make it makes it in 
difficult for them to be able to answer the phone in a timely manner, give information, et cetera, because they're, they're doing more work because they're down a, a position. So how many people are in records normally and what's the Three. number of people? Three. Three, so you're, you're at two right now? Correct. Okay, and then on the um, gang and narcotics, when I read eliminate proactive investigations, including gang and narcotics, I was thinking we were getting rid of that. But when I read the detail and look at that there's one vacancy, so it looks like, so, well, could you explain the unit please and what, how long the position's been open and what the impact is, please? Certainly. So we have uh, we have uh, a general detective unit and we have a special investigations unit, uh, which worked uh, together. Um, the general mm -hmm. investigations unit is uh, comprised normally of, of four detectives, um, and those are the detectives that handle every type of case that comes to them, from uh, you know misdemeanor cases to to homicides. Um, mm -hmm. And the special investigations unit is the unit that uh, is able to go out and proactively look at uh, uh, gang issues, uh, drug issues. Um, we have a liaison with the San Mateo County uh, Gang Information uh, Unit and Gang Task Force, along with the Narcotics Task Force, and they're the ones who work with those task forces. They're also part of a federal task force with uh, working with mm -hmm. the FBI uh, for large-scale uh, op large narcotics and gang uh, cases. Um, and so th those are what the, what the two units do in, in what the proposed quote unquote elimination of those would be is we would, we would, uh, the uh, special investigations unit would be uh, disbanded. Those officers would go back to patrol um, and the uh, detectives would go down to two detective in, in under this proposal, two detectives, um, uh, which would make it very difficult for them to investigate anything other than uh, very, very major, major serious crimes. So, but but the savings would can not you be really explain that to me. Sure. Which, I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish what you were saying. No, the, savings no, the, would not. the savings would not be realized uh, unless we were to make personnel cuts in patrol. If that, if if, if you follow that, so just disbanding the unit is not going to save any money unless those folks are folded back into patrol and then uh, le uh, less uh, senior officers um, at the bottom of the seniority list are in fact laid off. So I guess what I'm, I'm confused a little bit by all the, um, so why would we not just reduce the number by one, which is according to this report of the detective. So we, I, if I'm reading this correctly, it says unit will re be reduced to two general person crime detectives. Why wouldn't we go from three to two, but still leave the group intact and still maintain obviously less, but still have an effect hopefully effective uh, proactive investigations, including gang and narcotics. Why is this in either, right. you know, it's all or nothing? Well, well because the, you, the, the, the vacancies have already been taken. So they're, they're gone because of the traffic unit uh, and that decision that was already made. So in other words, uh, if, if you were going to realize any savings, you would have to cut positions. You would have to lay off officers and, and those officers normally would be in patrol because they're junior, and those detectives would have to go in to fill those positions in patrol. So, so I it don't, depends on I'm how sorry, many. I'm missing something. We had we um, said we needed we agreed to eliminate the traffic unit, which was five officers. So how does that decision affect this decision? Uh, well. At this time, it doesn't affect it doesn't affect it at all because the the five the five positions are going to include the four vacancies that are already there, which will be frozen, uh, and then one and then one uh, layoff, right? So if you were to make a further cut by cutting the detective unit to to uh, in what you're talking about, in order to realize any savings, you have to you'd have to cut the officers uh, at the bottom of the of the seniority list, and then these detectives would go back and that the units would be disbanded or, or, or reduced, and those officers would go back into the patrol division to make okay, up let the me, officers. Let, that... Thank you so much. Let me have um, Council Member Mueller speak and then I may come back. Thank you. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I, I really don't think we should be cutting that, guys. I really don't. I mean, I, I appreciate that we're looking diligently into this, but I don't, Property crimes are on the rise uh, throughout. It's been an issue in the city. I know it doesn't always yield a great uh, a great outcome, but they're on the rise. 
we've had a, and they were on the rise already during the, uh, I just, when I'm thinking of a basic level of service, uh, you know, one of the things that I think you people, people do want is, is, uh, is public safety as we go through these cuts. Uh, so, you know, I, the only thing, the, the question that I really had is eliminate, you know, the enhancement to open data and crime analysis. I was going to ask the chief, like, what's the impact there? What, what would be the impact to your service level if we did that? Uh, currently, that was a, that was also uh, an, an enhancement in order to uh, work on the open data that uh, we are currently in the process of going to a new, uh, so the city's going to a new system, the GIS system, uh, to do that type of uh, crime analysis and to put that, push that information out to the public to be as, as transparent as possible. Uh, I know in the last several years, transparency has been something that has been uh, requested and demanded from not only the city council, but the, the public in general. And that's what, what assisted us in doing that and, and being able to. Also, uh, crime analysis. Um, you know, one of, one of the things we have to, we really have to look at is how do we police smarter? Right and and intelligence-based policing. This is uh, that that position is the person who came up with with all the stats for the for the um, the police strategic uh, the, the police traffic strategic plan. Right. Right. Um, and so though that's that's what we're we're using that position for. So chief, I know you're kind of on the hot seat here uh, with this, and so I think it's fair. I'm going to do the same thing, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I know my colleagues are interested. But since we're focusing on the department. Like how does how does COVID nineteen sort of fit into your vision of the department and, and what your strategy is as you're looking at these cuts? Like is there things that we can do here within the strategy of that you have for the department that you think makes sense? Well, for, from my perspective, what I what I'm concerned about is 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 making permanent cuts in an emergency situation because we're gonna go back to normal. Eventually we're gonna go back to normal. And we're going to have the same population coming into the city, the same 20 or 30,000 people coming into the city, most likely, and and we're going to need the services um, of 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 the, the the police officers. So what my concern is now, obviously, if if, if positions are frozen, um, and and then you know everything everything is 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 normal again, and the economy uh, starts to rise, uh, and then we have a whole a whole new slew of traffic issues. Uh, as you know, for the last three or four years, that's that's the main concern of everybody was traffic. Well, obviously that's not the concern anymore, um, but the, the traffic will come back eventually. And then we will we will have the same problems that we've had in the past. And if not more, uh, depending on whether people are gonna be trusting, you know, mass traffic transit or not. Um, so my, my concern is making drastic cuts and, and drastic reductions to the police department that are just gonna have to be revamped up again in the future. Um, but going forward, you know, we, we are out uh, every day, uh, you know, in, in, you know, enforcing the law. We're, we're out uh, going to calls. Uh, we're even doing traffic enforcement during this time. Um, we're trying to do it as a, in a safe, effective manner. Are there any opportunities as a result of the pandemic that you can see in terms of pushing for the department to be more nimble? Or uh, well, we 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 I think we have. We we have turned we have turned on a dime. Uh, with the police department because we are the only department that has been working the entire time since the since March when the pandemic right. started, right? right? So we we've had to change the way we do police work 180 degrees, and this is something that we're having discussions about at the national level with my peers all over the country about how police work has changed because due to this this pandemic. Right. And some of those changes, I think, will in fact lead to better uh, policing. You know, we're probably going to we're probably going to do a lot more online or phone reports. Where in the past we've been really resistant to do that uh, because of of the possibility of somebody making a false report. But this is the way uh, you know we, we're heading today. Okay. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and pass over, and I just wanted to see if what what you thought the effect of. I was re I'm really focused on on 173. I think I'm less I think I'm less less interested in the reduced code enforcement re proactive person, but I'm really interested. I was interested to hear on 173 and if and candidly if my colleagues it sounds like 173 is important to 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 work there. So uh, I'm interested to hear what my colleagues have to say, but I'm uh, that's where I'm at. If I if I could just correct one thing, I was I was reminded that the police department wasn't the only department working. Public Works has been coming to work too, and what I mean by working, I meant by actually coming into the building is what I meant. I just yeah. want to put that out there. Well, and 
and chief i appreciate it. and also i get to look at you in the eyes and say i hope you didn't take my earlier comments negatively towards you they're not at all i have a tremendous amount of respect for you in the department so thank you vice mayor combs did you have a question Yeah, I did. And so um, I, I just want to point out, um, like in in response to sort of this the, the, the rabbit hole of, of value, I think that Council Member Nash took us down. I would have preferred if it if when it came to policing services, it was just presented to us as a sworn officer cut. Like what number of sworn officers are to be cut? Because this getting into like the traffic unit or the narcotics unit is is really i want to say like uh confusing and not clear and they're all interrelated and at the end of the day as the chief said it is always the junior people and so i would have preferred for us to this to have been presented to us is like this is the number whether it's vacant positions whether it's currently active sworn officers this is a possible cut this is the the impacts and left it to the chief and some later decision about like how those resources whether it meant sort of the, the traffic unit goes away because traffic is not an issue, whether it went narcotics unit goes away because that's not an issue, or, 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 or just allowing for a lot of a lot more variability. And so I just want to reiterate, I have not appreciated it at all, and I know the staff has put a lot of work on this, but I've said this a number of times, that I've not appreciated at all how this has been presented to us. And I don't think it has been presented to us in a way that it should have been. Um, it, it went in and provided these details in a way that I think are false and don't really present the real picture to the council or to the residents about what's happening. Um, and again, the, the the what Council Member Nash got into very much, you know, explained that because it's confusing. I was left confused by it. And if this had just been presented as a, as a, as a these are the number of officers to be cut, and the chief will make a determination, or it will be up to council policy at later on what we wanted to do with those res those now you know reduced resources would have been, I think, again, a, a less confusing way to present this. Um, and again, I've said that again, and, and, and you know, and I've said that a number of times and just wanted to reiterate that. Um, there, there are actually a number of, of things on, on this. Um, do you, you can chime in if you want to, Chief, on that. No, I was just, uh, the, the instructions that were given to the, the department heads was to do pro programmatic cuts. And that's, that's what we were asked to do. And this is what, I, I'm, I'm sorry that it's, it's confusing, but this is the way it was, it was uh, presented. Yeah, no, totally, t totally fair. And I do think the programmatic approach works um, for some other departments. I, I, I think here is where it is, it is very, very weak um, in, in, in how it, it comes out. And so, and so that, that's just, that, that, that's just my issue. Um, again, just sort of really quickly going through, I, I mean, there are like a number, like I would be willing to leave on the list 169. I mean, there, there are, these are all like not good options. So the, the issue here is between, you know, all bad options. And, and so, um, and, and so I, I just think the benchmark of, of how we're, we're looking at this needs to be clear that, that, that nothing, none of these are, 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 are good options. And, and I hope to the chief's point, I hope he's 100% right that we're going to go back to normal, you know, sometime very soon. But I don't know if that's the case. I mean, I, I hope, I hope you're right. We all hope you're right. Um, and and I think that again, there are some people who are saying that 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 you know normal what's normal has changed, and and that any sort of um, so, so, sort of return to something resembling normal will, will be will be slow and long. Um, so again, I would be okay with with reducing code enforcement. Um, um, I would be okay with eliminating proactive investigations again, just because I think that this, the weird way this has all been presented to us, um, is like, I'm making a decision that I think in theory should be made later on based on this, the situation at, 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 um, that presents itself. Um, 171, I would, to council member Carlson's point, I'd be okay with suspending proactive parking enforcement. I know of the Los Altos example too, uh, several, you know, downtown merchants have, have mentioned it. Um, and, and so again, not a great option, right? But, uh, if, if you're telling me that like, you, you know, for, for me, the goal is to get to as much of a balanced budget as possible, because again, I don't know what the next fiscal year will present itself as. And if there are certain revenue sources that are not likely to return to the city um, in the near term, I think we have to be prepared for, you know, possibly going into the reserve again. And so, so the more substantively we go into it now, 
the, the, the worst situation we put ourselves in. So I'm going to wrap up but really just, uh, and then, then the final one is, um, Again, I would be okay with, with also eliminating enhancement to open data um, and crime analysis, which I know Councilmember Mueller brought up. I think it is something that, that the mayor wants. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I certainly will, will hear her out on that. Um, but, but again, I think I would be uh, uh, um, okay with that, that staying as an elimination. And then and for the sake of, of time, I, I, won't, I won't speak on that, but I will ask the question because these are all things that we said we would discuss later, right? And so at some point, I just think we need to to vote, right? And and just see where this all falls out. And there's not going to be complete. There's, we, we're past the consensus. You know, we've already reached what we could reach consensus on. Now I think we need to just sort of start looking at like what's the vote, what has three votes, what does not have three votes. And and you know, I have no doubt that I may be on the winning side of some of those, or maybe on the losing side. But that's just it. I, I do think at some point we need to start, uh, you know, just just you know, going through and voting on these. And with that said, I I, I will I will not, <laughs> in the interest of time, will, will not comment further uh, when it comes to to, to the, the police services uh, uh, items. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. Councilmember Carlton. I have to unmute myself. As a point of order, uh, I made the motion to vote on uh, 1 to 49 in our last meeting. And uh, the only one that we pulled out of that, which back then was table 2A, 3, and 4, uh, the what is now number 173 uh, was in table 4, and we have already voted on that. We pulled it out and voted to keep that and cut everything else. So I'm not really sure uh, why it ended up back in discussion because we have technically already voted to keep that. Um, saying that, I'm happy at this point to make a motion uh, to suspend. Uh, Just a moment, Councilmember Carlton. Uh, Mr. Jacobson came on for a moment. I wasn't sure if he had a follow up to Vice Mayor Combs' statement or to an earlier statement. Uh, it was actually just a point of clarification, and it actually sounds like Councilmember Carlton was going down the path that I was going to suggest, which was um, just so that we can keep traffic, track of exactly which items should be removed um, and using uh, the same same terminology so we're all on the same page. Um, so if uh, as items are completed and there's no more discussion or questions by the council, uh, if Madam Mayor, you could uh, tell us whether items should be moved to the keep on the list um, and if they are to keep on the list we will incorporate them into the budget um, and if they are removed from discussion we will not incorporate them in the city manager's proposed budget um, so as we move through the list if you could just let us know each item as the discussion is completed uh, and we'll keep track of that on our end um, one other minor note not for this moment but so that i don't forget uh, there was it was, did come to our attention that we missed one item uh, in community development, and that is long range planning. That was originally item number 49. Uh, it was put on the discuss list, or we understood it to be uh, tagged for future discussion. So it's not on this list, but I don't want it to be completely lost. Um, and then the very last point is that um, we do understand the frustration with um, the way things are presented. This is not our ideal way of preparing a budget. Um, these are in many cases not independent events so if programs are eliminated and they have uh, there are other vacancies in that department it really depends on which programs are eliminated as to where those vacancies go or do not go um, so we did our best to display where people where staff members currently are but they are not fully independent Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Jacobson. And so, so the reason following up to Councilmember Carlton's comment um, on item 173, eliminate enhancements to open data and crime analysis. So if we already decided that that was to not be cut, so then why is it on the discuss list? Is that for clarity? Uh, that was in that was not staff's understanding but we can absolutely move that to the do not incorporate the do not keep if that is council's desire we can so one of the reasons that i i asked for it not to be cut is i see this as a form of transparency and so having a, an open data on crime analysis is is transparency and i'm not cutting anything that provides transparency 
Council Member Mueller and then Council Member Nash. That's fine. I don't, I mean, we have lots of other stuff to go through. So yeah. it's just going to come down to at some point, you know, what one program is against another. So, uh, but I, I'm, like I said, I didn't have a strong, I said of all the things on there, that's the one that I could look at just because we, it's something that's not even filled and that we're not doing now. Uh, and that's because it's not filled and it's not doing, and we're not doing it now, it saves someone's job when we look at something else. Because uh, it's not a level of service. When I look at this, I, I think of, is it a level of service that's already being provided in the city? Uh, or, or will the level of service in the city change and be reduced because of it? And then because this isn't already, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a vacant right now, right, Chief? Is that right? No, no, no? I was going to correct you. No, it's not. It is, it is, it is. Uh, filled and the that person has been working at this uh, uh, for about eight eight months to a year now. So can I ask you because and then the other thing I want to say is based on Councilmember uh, Combs' top comments about programmatic. I actually don't have a problem with programmatic because we can say that the traffic unit can go away. The traffic unit has gone away before. And I understand what the impact that is. That being said, do you need us to say to you tonight if you want to move around your resources differently? Uh, afterwards, if you think traffic ticks up before it's completely up, that you want to assign someone to do traffic, <laughs> you don't need us to tell you that. No, and, and and honestly, operational decisions rest in my office. Right. Uh, so so we 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 would make operational decisions based on the needs, uh, but it it would be also based on the resources we had. If we don't have the resources, then we have to not do something. I know you've heard that before, and it's not something people, people want to hear, uh, right. but it all depends on the resources also. And if we said to you, uh, you know, we want, you know, so basically, I mean, you have the flexibility in this, if we get rid of something to have someone to move people around to do things if you need to. Sure, sure. Operationally, we can, in okay. fact, adjust, but we have, do we do have minimum staffing requirements um, and, and safety of, of officers to, to also keep in mind operationally? Of course, yeah. And that's why, you know, and that's why and I've defended in the past, I think the minimum ratio of patrol officers to, to to the public is something that the city's tried very hard to maintain. So I understand that, but I just wanted to cover all those those things with you. So I mean, so with that, I will uh, I will go ahead and let let others talk. But I'm, you know, I mean, basically what it comes down to is when we look at this guys, is do we do we think that there's he's it's listed out programmatically there, but but if we think that there's more money that you want to take from this, like you want to take another officer. You could ask the chief what the impact of that is, and he can tell you what the impact of that is. So, and it's a question that comes down to two: is it a civilian officer versus, you know, versus a, a sworn officer? So, with that, I'll leave it to you guys. Councilmember Carlton, did you have a follow-up? Exactly where I was going before I I was stopped with the motion was. Uh, and I don't do this happily, but I do this out of necessity and also in, in uh, interest of time to keep us moving on uh, to uh, cut 167 to 172 again uh, to save 173. And uh, but I want I make this motion with one uh, with one understanding, and that is that the police chief is a professional in his area, and if he needs to move individuals around. Uh, I assume he has the right to do so, and, and he's just confirmed now that he does. So I feel that... Uh, Councilmember Carlton, just just so you know, I, I don't support suspending overnight parking enforcement. I have a, a list of cars and probably about 20 complaints about um, parking enforcement not happening now. Um, car People parking in Menlo Park that, do, that are not residents, um, and okay, just the... Fine question for the chief. When when we spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago about 168, you told me that the uh, overnight parking permit sales could be split into two. That right now you can go in in an emergency uh, and get one in person, or you can get it online. And the online would be able to con continue, and we could cut the uh, in-person version of getting the, the parking permit. Is that, did I misunderstand you when you explained that to me? N well, the online uh, 
part of it is not is not complete yet. We don't have a program. We don't have an uh, IT. We don't have a program yet to do that online to actually print out your own your own um, permit at home. Um, uh, residents are allowed to get uh, receive uh, receive 100 uh, parking permits, 50 in the first six months, 50 the second six months. Uh, but they could also go in uh, into the police department to buy an emergency one, uh, you know, one off. Um, does that answer your question? And, and also to, to the mayor's uh, question about overnight parking, all parking enforcement has been suspended during this pandemic. Um, so that's that's why that's not occurring. Uh, secondly, the overnight parking position is vacant anyway. So even if it, we were trying to, to, to uh, enforce overnight parking at, at this time, that position is vacant. Council Member Nash, did you have a follow up? Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, Councilmember Carlton, could you please repeat what your motion was? Because um, I think you included reduced patrol number 172. And did you intend to do that? I thought that's what we had said we were doing. Um, I'm happy to take a friendly amendment and keep the uh, the parking, at which point we keep 60, 167, 168. We cut 169, 170, 171, 172, and we uh, keep 173. So we keep 67, 68, and 73, and we cut the others, as, as I understood what we were in agreement with. If I get that wrong, please, I'm, I'm open for friendly amendments on that. So I guess my friendly amendment, first of all, would be I would actually include 168 only because it's a vacant position and has been vacant for a while. And um, it's, they seem to have been managing as is. Oh, I understand I'm, that it would be nice to, but. I thought it had to go together with 167. I'm, I'm quite happy to cut all of them except 167 and 173. Okay, then I would like to hear more about 172, which we hadn't discussed before, because that's eight officers in a reduced patrol situation, and I'd like to hear what the impact of that is. Yeah, that's the that's the giant win in all this. Right, and if we're doing that on top of the reduced um, the um, traffic unit, um, I just I want to hear how all this plays out in the chief's mind, please. If you were to do the entire cut of reduced patrol on top of the traffic unit, that would be a reduction of uh, 13 police officer positions. That would be a, uh, a major reduction in the police officers we have available for the city of Menlo Park. Uh, that would be about a 25 percent or 20, 20 to 25 percent cut in our in our sworn police force. Um, if that were to happen, um, uh, and again, it goes hand in hand. And I go, I, I know this is confusing, uh, but in order to do the things that we're required to do, and that is be on patrol. We're all patrol officers in the end. Is be on patrol, uh, respond to calls, and answer 911 calls. Um, all the other types of uh, investigations we do would have to be curtailed, and all those units probably would be uh, would have to be uh, disbanded and rolled into patrol to, to make sure we had the the minimum staffing. Councilmember Nash, did you have a follow-up for Chief Bertini? You're on mute. No, I don't, not at the moment, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, guys, I wanna reiterate, like I'm not, I'm gonna be a no vote on this one. So I don't, I can't, I'm not going to be able to look people in the eye, constituents in the eye, and say, I cut this much from the police department, which serves everyone, and I spent this much on the child care center, which serves like 63 people. Like, I can't do that. Mr. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, I, I have a question um, that you may or may not have the answer to uh, because I'm thinking about what Vice Mayor Combs said um, as far as how we're going about doing program cuts um, for myself uh, looking at the the department as a whole as opposed to piecemeal made more sense um, but just thinking about um, car allowances does do each of our departments have a car allowance and if so um, what does that program cost Um, there are a number of individual employees with car allowances. Um, it's not so 
it's tied more to the individual. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. It, I, I don't know off the top of my head. We can certainly get that answer for you. Um, so it would be one number um, since it's citywide. individual citywide. Okay. Because um, that would be something I would be interested in cutting as opposed to a, a, a program. That would be a program I would be interested in cutting considering how many vehicles we already have. So um, just a, a point of clarification for you then, um, do you mean reducing pool vehicles, for instance, or um, there is an auto allowance for some employees who are required to have vehicles so that they can travel for city business? Is it, so there's multiple programs that allow for car allowances? There or is there is. one and there's different types within it? Some employees have auto allowances uh, due to the requirement to travel for city business. And then there are vehicles which are available to city employees depending on their work. So for instance, um, building inspectors may have city vehicles available to them to go do building inspections. And then there are a number of vehicles which are uh, pooled and available to city employees as on an as needed basis. Well, that one I would definitely want to look at the pooled vehicles. Um, since sometimes those are just sitting. So this would be um, a question that would be directed to uh, Mr. Gaia, um, though if I may, um, I do want to make one more clarification. Uh, this is not the last time you will see the budget, so we will be able to give you a holistic uh, view of the department as it would be constructed once these changes have been incorporated into the proposed budget. At that point, it will become uh, extremely clear which positions, um, which vacant positions were eliminated, which would result in layoffs, um, and th you that will be the the clearest opportunity to view everything on a fully holistic basis once we understand which positions would move around due to vacancies. Okay, thank you for the clarification, Mr. Jacobson, and um, I brought this up in previous meetings, and that is having a comprehensive list of services. Um, so that we're not piecemealing, um, making decisions about a traffic unit or reduced patrol. Um, I'd rather talk about a, a pooled car allowance. Um, but if we had a comprehensive list, and I know that the staff wasn't able to get it to us um, in time enough for this meeting, um, but for me, it would it would make more sense. Um, Councilmember Carlton. Your your mic is off, Council Member Carlton. Excuse me. If we pull out uh, the patrol, the overnight parking, and the open data, uh, we're cutting about $700,000. And uh, that is mostly for the, the proactive items and the proactive parking enforcement during the day, that sort of thing. Um, I say this, I know my colleagues know this, but I'm saying this for the record. Uh, when we do layoffs, we give people, we have a 45 day period by which time we let them know that we're going to lay them off. In that 45 days, if the bargaining unit, if that union would like to come and speak to us, I would be delighted if the uh, police union would like to uh, voluntarily take a police cut as uh, some other groups are discussing. Uh, to bring them back down, frankly, to the the average on what the police forces in the peninsula are are earning, uh, that would save jobs and uh, also set us up better for uh, if this does get better, it's uh, keeping people on board. I would I would rather do because then we can ramp up hours and uh, it benefits us greatly. So I I'm not making these suggestions. I did not make that because I am happy to do so. I feel like it's necessary and I'm happy. I respect my colleagues and if there's certain things that you feel strongly about like open data, like uh, nighttime parking patrol, I'm, I'm happy to include that but we have to make some cuts and this is uh, sadly one union that is not wanting to talk to us at all about working with us to do anything but make cuts. So with that in mind, I have made a motion and I'll repeat it for clarity. And I hope in 45 days, maybe things can change. I'm sorry, Drew, I, I see your hands up. 
to, did you want me to repeat that question? Well, I was only going to say that, yeah, I know you had a motion um, and I didn't, it, it was confusing. And so um, um, I, I think I would appreciate if we just went down these line by line um, and each person sort of, and we did just draw polls on it um, uh, because it's just going to be like what's pulled out, what's not. I mean, I know Councilmember Mueller is not there with the reduced patrol. Um, you, you know, the mayor's not there with open data. And, and I would just prefer if like, you know, they're numbered that we just go down and just see where it's, it's falling um, because I think the comprehensive motion is, because it, 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 I may be there with you, but I was just sort of confused. And so I, I, I will repeat and I repeat as, as I understand it and, and jump in if you don't, because I, again, I don't want this to end up being another hour uh, discussion. A 167 uh, overnight parking stays because people feel passionate about the overnight parking. Uh, 68 goes, 69 goes, 70 goes, 71 goes, 72, it sounds like Council Member Mueller, and, and frankly, I, I kind of agree, 72 can stay, 73 stays. Are you all comfortable with that? So just to repeat it, so 168 is a cut, 169 is a cut, 170, cut 171 cut and we so we keep 167 172 and 173 uh it seemed that that uh council member mueller uh felt strongly about patrol and and i respect that bertini is going to move people around as as he needs to anyway so that gives us seven hundred thousand dollars cut and that leaves us with uh one Point eight million still in the, the put back. Are people comfortable with that? I'll I'll second that, and so and so we we can see if people are comfortable with it. Well, let's Councilmember Nash. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pose, and I I we could also take one seventy two and not do a full eight. So I just so wanted cut it to by fifty percent. Or even 25%. Um, you know, it's presumably it's not all or nothing. So I guess. Um, go ahead. I, I'm just great. Councilmember Mueller, what are your thoughts on a, either a 25 or a 50% cut? Are you all or I'm nothing? Um, yeah, I'm not on board. But I'm fine with you guys. If you guys want to take a vote, that's fine. But I'm not on board. So and I'm not going to hold it against you guys, but I just like I don't see. I mean, I know I'm not, and I'm also I can't I'm not on board with getting rid of the gang and narcotics unit, like because I know what was happening with respect to the increase in drug use that was happening prior to the pandemic breaking out before at the high schools. Uh, so I'm just I think you know I just I'm not I'm not in. The, the level and depth that we're going into the police department as compared to the, the entire budget is, I'm not, I was on board with the traffic department guys. I don't think I'm going to get there as far as you guys are willing to go with the police department and that's fine. Uh, Council member Nash and then vice mayor Combs and then council member okay. Carlton. I'll let council member or uh, vice mayor Combs speak first. So, so can someone on staff answer for me, with the elimination of the traffic unit, does that result in the furlough layoff of a single sworn officer? Yes. yes. It, one one officer. We have four one openings. Officer. One officer. That's correct. But it's, one it's officer. Taking, that's correct. But it's taking five positions and, and eliminating or freezing them. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. But one of the current capacity, right, yes. that is on the streets. Yes. One officer. Correct. So, so I just don't accept this idea that like taking, you know, adding some part of this reduced patrol is gutting the police department. Again, lots of not great decisions here, but, but, but is not currently again, and it, you know, again, the loss of one job is, 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 is horrible. And, and I'm not like sort of trying to minimize it, but, but at, on the table to date is, is only the elimination of one of one one currently sworn officer. Um, I just so, that's not that's not how you look at a budget, guys. 
So you don't, I mean, we, it's helpful to us that when positions are vacant, that they're vacant and we're not harming anyone, but those are positions that are accounted for in the budget and that there was a level of service accounted for with them. Now, granted, those were five people that were moved, that what the way that was happening with the track, with the transportation, my, my understanding of the traffic unit was that people got injured, that there were things happening in that unit. And so what was happening was that there were people moving up through the cadet line, we're gonna take those places and, and people, well, actually that's not even true. We have people in that unit right now What's happened is we have people in those units right now who are doing that job, all right? There are people assigned to that right now. What's gonna happen is when we get rid of the traffic unit, they're gonna move down and they're gonna bump people who are going for the open positions, okay? So we are getting rid of five positions in the traffic unit. That is a level of service that will disappear for, for, the, for the city. Now, I understand the fact that it only results in the loss of one officer currently on the force, but that doesn't matter because what happened was there was we in every that we, we can make that argument across the board with other with other departments that had vacant positions. But uh, it's uh, uh, cost savings. Councilmember Mueller, the chief just said that he re retains operational authority of the police department. So he's going to make a decision about the traffic unit. So someone some people could say it's theater for us to even engage in this debate about eliminating the traffic unit. Right, and so because he I said he just, retains operational just, uh, operational authority. I totally disagree with that analysis. I just, guys, look. If you want to cut into the, I, 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 I am, I just, I am totally against cutting into the patrol unit, and uh, and taking away officers for public safety for the city and getting rid of the narcotics, invest and the person doing investigations around gang and narcotics, while at the same time we're going to spend the amount of money that we're spending in other areas of this budget that serve far fewer people. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. I'm not sure who had their hand at first, if it was Councilmember Nash or Councilmember Carlton. Councilmember Carlton. Yeah, first of all, I wanna, I wanna stop bad language right there. We're not eliminating anything. We are, elimin we are rolling back the proactive, but they, they're still gonna be there. So I'm gonna change this whole thing and see what you guys think about this. Um, we've already said that the, the police chief is gonna move people around as he needs to. So us looking at this and saying, we're going to eliminate, we're gonna roll back, proactive, all this, this emotive language is completely a, a red herring because the, the police chief is gonna move people as he needs to move them anyway. I, I withdraw my motion, I put forward the motion. We're going, I, I suggest that we, Cut the police budget by 1.2 million, with the with the direction that we keep uh, proactive parking enforcement at night, and we keep the open data, and we let the police chief do his job in uh, moving the police around to address crime as it's needed in in Menlo Park. Are you saying 1.2 million in addition to the direction we've already given on the traffic unit? No, I'm saying I'm saying I withdraw the whole thing. All I'm saying is 1.2 million, the, the police chief, and with the direction that we, we keep, we make sure that we keep doing the, the nighttime parking and the open data. And the police chief knows where he's going, he's told us he's going to move people around as he needs them anyway. We're not eliminating anything anyway. If we say we need you to, to pull out 1.2 million, the police chief can come back and, and so, move people as, as he needs to move. Yeah, I don't know, guys. I mean, I, I get what you're trying to do, but. So can we reach out to our city manager, Ms. Starla Jerome Robinson? What are your thoughts on Councilmember Carlton's proposal? Well, I, um, we, we can do it either way. I think we were trying to make sure that the council was understanding what public policy direction we were receiving. So that it was less arbitrary, but if you want the, uh, do you want, if you want to give myself and the police chief the discretion of just reducing his overall budget by 1.2, then we can, we can discuss that and include that reduction in the budget. Uh, thank you, um, Starla. I didn't know if, if Councilmember Nash, I know you had your hand up earlier. So did you still have a question? 
Well, I guess we've sort of gone a long way from where I had my comment, but my comments are first of all um, to Council Member Mueller. While it says eliminate proactive investigations, including gangs and narcotics, in fact, we are talking about reducing the, the group from the unit from three to two, and that one extra person has been vacant for months. When we're talking, so many of these positions have been vacant for months, and very honestly, that's what we're doing in other areas too. Last Tuesday, we cut areas which had, or we froze positions which were vacant, saying you've been getting along with it. We need to keep our belt tight for a while longer. Um, so I really don't understand how this is different. And this is from a larger pool, granted, very, very, very critical function done citywide. Um, but I think there are some tough choices. I particularly am having trouble with code enforcement, but I also think for the greater good right now, we need to go in for it. I do not um, like the $1.2 million approach. I think that we do need to give more direction that the chief will then move people around. And I would actually like some um, transparency there at not to, um, just so that we know how, what the department looks like. But um, the 1.2 million, we had 1 million from the traffic unit. So that doesn't seem like it's really, um, I don't, I, I guess I'd love to know how you came up with that number, Council Member Carlton, um, before I could say whether I support it or not. Sure, um, the whole amount together was uh, 2.5, and so I just cut it in two. And the uh, the number what of all whole the, amount? What whole uh, amount? The everything in the in the police department section. On this sheet. Yes. Okay, but we still had the other we still had other items in. So you're this is where I'm confused, is we still had items on the remain on the list. Um, where we had, if you uh, if you simply uh, add up 167 to 173, it added up to 2.476, and I just divided that. Now we could also okay. look at it as it's 692,000 were the things that we'd agreed on before, and then we could say reduce patrol half, and do it that way, 692. Wait, Kat, can we, excuse me, can we stop for one second? Sure. I would support, if you are saying that we are doing, we are leaving what we did last Tuesday and we are now um, containing items 167 to 173 to 1.2 million. Yes. And that we do not, okay, that's a different, that I could support. I couldn't support pulling everything that we decided before. No, 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 no. That's what I'm talking about. Making very okay, clear. That's, yes. Okay, because I thought we were talking about including the traffic unit, which I, which was a prior decision. Oh. Okay. Thank you. So, do you do you agree? So you were talking strictly about um, this um, page C two point ten, and you were talking about actually. Could you please repeat that then? Yes, and I think I can. Okay. We, we've already agreed, agreed, I believe, on 173. We've already agreed on 167, that we want proactive parking at night, and we want uh, the open data, correct? Correct. And, and pretty much everything that isn't listed here is, is not in discussion. So between 168 and 172, uh, we're cutting that back. And the police chief said that he's going to move people around as is necessary anyway. So we're doing a nod to the fact that that's the reality. We're not eliminating any programs. Uh, we're not necessarily filling in where they're not filled in now. And we're letting the police chief do his job within that budget. Councilmember Nash, did you have a follow-up for Councilmember Carlton so I can? Um, no, I just, I will support that. Councilmember Mueller. 
Yeah, I'm a no vote on that. So and that's fine. Uh, the reason, guys, is 1.2 million just happens to be the uh, pretty close, I think, to the number that that the POA is. It feels arbitrary to me. Uh, I think that uh, I actually am more comfortable with making programmatic cuts. And if the chief needs to move around things later based on what he's looking at in terms of what's happening in the city, he can do that. But the idea uh, for me that we're going to pull a number out of the hat that we think looks right and then he's going to figure it out when it comes to public safety just doesn't work for me. Um, so I uh, I just can't I can't go there with that with that approach on this. Um, what I also would suggest is that when we're talking about public safety, which is something that serves the entire city, to have a discussion like this and then to make a vote before we've had the discussion on the other items to weigh to weigh those items against this one, I think is not the approach that I would take. I, I'd ha I think it's good we've had this discussion, but I'd look at the rest of the budget and then try to figure out when you're doing a when you're trying to figure out the number you're trying to get to if there are other cut but other cuts that might be more appropriate. But it, it, that being said, I can tell you guys uh, want to move forward on it, so. Uh, that's fine. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, so just so I'm understanding, between items 168 and 172, we're saying um, the direction is that there needs to be a reduction of $1.2 million, like, like $1.2 million in, in current revenue spend um, needs to come from that area. Is, is that is that the motion, Councilmember Carlton? Yes. Okay, um, and and I, I I can support that also, and I would just you know add that as has been said to us multiple times during this meeting and prior meetings, this is not the final time we'll see these. These are not all final decisions, and so I do think that we'll have the ability to um, we'll, we'll get to that more holistic view. But I do think it's important to sort of you know sort of start sort of laying some clear ground of where where there are sort of a majority of votes and then move on and again if if then if things change as we start looking at other things then we can certainly come back um right. and 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 way changes if if you want it to be more programmatic i'm happy to lay it out like this so that maybe it's more clear as well to staff uh, between 168 and 172 uh 68 69 70 71 get cut and uh Six million of reduced patrol gets cut. Uh, a million of reduced patrol stays. Does if does that? No, six hundred thousand. Six hundred, yeah, yeah. What did I say? You said six million. Oh. <laughs> no, six hundred thousand. If that makes it more clear, we can do it that way. So let's call the question because we can keep discussing this for another hour. I think. Unless Ray, Ray, I don't mean to cut you yeah. off. No, I just wanted to make clear that I. And still would have been supportive of cutting uh, cutting uh, traffic uh, to the tune that was talked about prior, and then uh, programmatically looking uh, through the rest of the budget, having and then we could have revisited some of these areas. But at this point, I'm definitely not on board with reducing patrol six hundred thousand. So I will, I'll, but that's fine. We don't have to revisit all of it. But I did want to make clear for the record, I do support cuts within the police department and uh, and in those cuts uh, and had previously voted for those and would have voted for those today. Well, this will come back before us again. This isn't written in stone at this point. Yes. And, and, and for those who are listening, 45 days before the layoffs are final. Yes, thank you for the clarity, um, Council Member Carlton. So do we have, uh, we still have a motion and a second on the floor. So does it need to be restated, um, Ms. Heron, for clarity? So I currently have the motion as a $600,000 cut between items 168 and 171. Is that correct? That is not correct. Oh, thank you. Can you please restate then? We are keeping 167. We are cutting 168, 169, 170, 171. We are cutting 600,000 out of 172 and we're keeping 173. 
Okay, so the motion on the floor as stated by Council Member Car Carlton, do I have a second? I just asked a clarification. So what are we doing with traffic then? Is that in addition or because it's not in here? It's in addition. Yeah. Okay, it's all in addition to traffic. Okay. Ms. Heron. So again, the motion as stated by Council Member Carlton, I still need a second. I'll second. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. By roll call vote, Council Member Carlton? Aye. Council Member Mueller? No. Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Combs? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. The motion passes with Council Member Mueller dissenting. Okay, now can I ask? Real quick, guys, uh, that's a pretty. I think I see of that as a as a potential significance in service reduction. Are you guys interested in talking to the county at all, or no? I'm not. I am not. No. I I have heard enough uh, complaints from people who live in Menlo Park in the county, and I don't want to publicly uh, speak poorly of the sheriff's department. But that is why. I do not. I do not believe it's the same standard of service. It's fine. I just didn't want to leave it there. I just wanted to follow. No, I, I understand, and, and and I agree with you. I I very very highly treasure uh, the police and the service that we have, and I feel that that would not be the same high standard of service. And I don't want to. That's why. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll just add. I do think it's an important debate, but not one I'm supportive of. Uh, again, I, I do value the importance of local control, and and as I've stated in the past, like sort of uh, giving up police services, it's a one-way street, and so maybe you will get an introductory rate that's really attractive, but at that point you become beholden to essentially the price that the county dictates from that point forward, because you know the cost of reestablishing an independent police department after it has been as abolished are are too astronomical to to ever revisit the issue, and so. From that point on, it, it would be the sheriff telling us essentially like how much they want to charge um, for or, or how much uh, that it costs for, for for police services. And so, um, again, I do think that that the debate is important, but um, I, I clearly would would side on um, at this moment keeping keeping our, our independent police force. Okay. And just to be clear, guys, my I I'm not advocating that we would do it. Uh, ultimately, I was just advocating that I think uh, it would not cause any prejudice to look at the data. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Okay, well, we are on number yes, 174 through 180 through 182. The last, oh, Mr. Jacobson, did you need some clarity? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, I was going to make the suggestion that we uh, show a slightly different view. We uh, keep this data in a productivity tool and I can show a view um, and perhaps you can let me know whether that is productive or not. Um, so I am showing what this would look like. I can try zooming in a little bit more, but it will uh, make it slightly more difficult to um, show the whole screen. So. There is the option here to basically dynamically show uh, where council desires these. So we've, um, for the previous items that were just discussed, these have been moved into different lists. Um, so if the council desires, I can use this view or I can go back to the view, which is the handout that you were provided prior to the meeting. Is there a preference for anyone to keep the what we had or use the table from monday.com? I prefer the spreadsheet, but that's just me. Okay, well, we'll keep the spreadsheet. Is there any way? Oh, is there any way ahead. on the spreadsheet to get? I'm sorry. Is there any way on the spreadsheet to have 174 all of the public works um, put up at the same time? So 174 to 177 at one time. That would be my preference with the spreadsheet. Uh, I apologize, that will take me a moment. I, I can get that, um, but it will take me a moment to open the Excel version of it. 
Madam Mayor, may I take a brief five minute break? Yes. Thank you. We will all need to turn oh. our, okay. our cameras off.
Welcome back, City Council. Uh, we may reconvene the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Aaron. Um, Mr. Jacobson, were you able, so you did get all of them on one list of the public works? Yeah, so I believe these are the ones that Councilmember Nash was referring to. Thank you. Okay, we'll just go down the list. I think, I believe one item isn't on here, which was item 173. Or 174. Mr. Jacobson, did you renumber them? Let me double. These appear to be the same numbering, Madam Mayor. Is my is the Excel screen currently visible for you? Yes. Okay. So I think Councilmember Nash. Um, so yes, I think we start at 174, so we don't need to see 173, which was okay. um, the police department and what we just spoke about. Then. Okay. The first item, uh, 174, reduce parks and parks and landscape area maintenance. Council Member Carlton. Yeah, I have a qu clarifying question. Um, when we'd seen this before, sorry, I have an airplane going overhead. Um, when we'd seen this before, we it, they were saying that it was part uh, landscape maintenance, part roundup impact, and then some of it was uh, safety and, and removing slides and different things like that. And I'd asked to uh, separate out the roundup part of it, and I was wondering if that had been done at this point. I just wanted to clarify what we were looking at. Good evening, council members. Um, Nikki Nagaya, uh, Public Works Director. Um, so I can give a brief overview of this item to start off the conversation if that's helpful and then happy to take any questions that you have about it. Um, so as the reductions that we've presented are, are programmatic in nature, uh, there are a number of, of items for your consideration in, in this, this program. And as, um, as you've been seeing, all of these reductions are, are difficult. So I just wanna start, start with that. Um, one of the elements in this program is to eliminate the um, herbicide free parks program. So that was a $400,000 service enhancement that the city had added uh, in the last two or three years. And so we wanted to put that forward just for your reconsideration to make sure that that's the, the correct use of, of those funds since it is a significant dollar amount. Um, there's also uh, an additional service level enhancement that was um, elsewhere shown in the budget documents that was a $1.3 million expansion of that program that was under consideration for our current fiscal year, which you've since um, recommended we take off the list going forward. Um, so that's $400,000 for the, the herbicide-free park, herbicide free parks program, which is a contract service. Um, and also in this $700,000 was um, identified for elimination of a that is currently assigned to clean Milan Park, um, the dog park and sports field daily. It also would reduce landscape median maintenance uh, along the Sand Hill Road median, which is another contract service. And finally, um, there was also elimination of one parks maintenance worker of our, our seven member crew that um, 
would have an impact on how much parks maintenance we could do generally, both with um, landscape, weeding, upkeep, as well as maintain, maintaining the, the park's equipment, um, things like playgrounds and things like that. Um, and so all of those combined are the $700,000 dollar amount total that's shown on the screen. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to answer detailed questions about any of those elements. Councilmember Carlton. I want I just want to understand that I understood what you just said. So 400 of that 700 is specifically for Roundup or not? Um, that's for a contract that um, is part of the herbicide free parks program, meaning that we do not use herbicides in the parks. So the blue of Roundup it is four hundred thousand dollars. The four hundred is part of that. Or or the with four hundred there's Roundup plus uh, other things in 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 that 400 yeah uh four hundred thousand dollars is just for the herbicide free program okay and the other 300 is for other things those other things correct okay. thank you council member mueller i want to make sure i, I what i so before if we the this would bring us, if we did this, we would go back to using Roundup? So um, maybe I'll just back, back up one, one second. So the Herbicide Free Parks Program was put in place to eliminate the use of herbicides in the parks, but not on the sports fields. There was a separate conversation that was pending uh, for this current budget year uh, for sports fields and the medians, which I'll, I'll kind of take off the table for now. So right now we're just talking about uh, herbicide use in the parks. Um, so if we eliminated that program, yes, we would need to go back to using herbicides. Doesn't necessarily mean we need to go back to using uh, Roundup or uh, glyphosate is the, the um, non-patented name. So um, there are other herbicides that we could use, but um, there it would reintroduce herbicides into the parks. So, Nikki, I, when this first came up a while back, there were meetings that we had with Palo Alto, and uh, where they we met with them. They've been herb they were herbicide free for a while, and what they said was, you know, you can use you can use basically you just trim the grass, and you don't worry that there's weeds in it, right? I mean, you, you just have a different tolerance level that it's not going to be. Uh, you know, at layman's terms, it's just not going to be a pristine field. You're going to have you're going to have some weed introduction into it. You're just going to cut it short, and it won't matter. Matter. Why? Um, why? Why is it that Palo Alto is saying to us that they can do this cost effectively, but it's costing us this much money? Is there something that's unique about how we're that, or do they have capital equipment we don't, or like what is it? I don't understand. Okay. No, it's a great question. We, we've had a, a lot of discussions um, with Palo Alto's assistant director in community services, so we definitely appreciate uh, his time for, for sharing his expertise, as well as our parks maintenance staff is also really knowledgeable about these best practices that um, we can apply for, for uh, not using herbicides. So there's a couple of items that um, I think are, are worthwhile to this discussion. Um, one is that while Palo Alto um, has been doing herbicide-free um, parks maintenance for, for some time, um, there's a, definitely an acknowledgement that weed tolerance is um, a very important part of, of that conversation. So we, we just have to tolerate more, more weeds as part of uh, that program. And that's something that I think we've, we've generally accepted um, from the staff level, but as an example, just through the shelter in place when we weren't doing um, any parks maintenance or landscape maintenance, um, while gardening uh, activities were prohibited, we've, we received um, over two dozen complaints about the growth of weeds around the city. And so um, I think we're, we're still working through trying to, to understand where the community's tolerance is on, on the acceptance of, of weeds. Um, and we're, we're continuing to do our best to address that backlog of issues that, that have been created through, through the shelter in place order. Um, 
there's no fundamental equipment or difference in the approach between Palo Alto and, and what Menlo Park is doing, um, but it, there is a general acknowledgement that um, the use of herbicides is the most cost-effective way to manage the fields. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best, but Palo Alto still does pay um, a, a cost to do the, the herbicide-free program, and I believe they're still using herbicides in select locations as well um, while, while they're continuing to, to try and shift away from their use uh, across the city. How does, how does their maintenance schedule differ from ours? Do we know, like, have we dug, dug into that deeply enough to see what the comparison is? So we, we've gotten information about their uh, staffing levels as well as uh, their contract costs. And um, in total, we have um, a seven member crew and then uh, with our contract services, that adds roughly four and a half additional, uh, we'll call full-time staff equivalents. Um, Palo Alto has a, a much higher level of investment in that um, in their program. So as a comparison, our um, parks workers cover about 30% uh, more acreage uh, per person than Palo Alto does. So they, they have a, a more expansive program than, than what we do today, even with the contract services that we've put in place. I apologize for, for the dog barking in the background. It's okay. My dog jumped up my lap in the middle of this, so we're good. Actually, I picked them up, but it's all right. So I heard that Palo Alto, I think it was Palo Alto that said that they actually saved money use, use, when they stopped using uh, herbicides, using Roundup. And, and I heard you say that before about the tolerance. So... Um, when uh, I had to, to run an errand. So I actually stopped and looked at a field in Palo Alto and it looked fine. I didn't really see any thing that looked like we were tolerating weeds. And uh, long story short, I stopped in the middle of El Camino to chase ducks out of the middle of the road at El Camino in Stamford a couple of weeks ago. There were some baby ducks. And as I was standing on the side and called the people to, to come get baby ducks. Uh, I looked around and I, I didn't see uh, weeds there really in particular either. So I'm curious to see an example of where where the higher weed tolerance is because I just don't see it in Palo Alto. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not there, but I, I, I am confused as to why, were they spending so much before that by not doing it, they saved money? I, I, um, I just don't and why it costs us so much more when other cities are saying that uh, it doesn't cost them more. So our understanding from Palo Alto staff is that they're still selectively using herbicides on their sports fields and in their medians. So they, they are not using them on um, other, other park locations, but in those areas, they're still applying select herbicides and following all the, the requirements to keep everyone safe when they do it, but they're, they're still using herbicides in those locations. But they're not using Roundup. Um, I I believe they're using glyphosate. Yes. Okay. So I'm I'm passionately against that. If Google it, you there are all these lawsuits right now going on. We we may talk about saving four hundred thousand, but how much are we going to lose? Not only lawsuits, but in quality of life for our residents when people end up with uh, with cancer, when the children end up with with nerve damage from from these chemicals. So for me, it's not even a it's not even a debate uh, that that it's not okay to use the the roundup. How we how we get around that, what we do after that, is uh, more of a pro program issue. But we know for a fact that roundup hurts people, so we shouldn't use it. I, to me, that's not even there's not even a conversation around that. So what did we use prior to Roundup? So prior to the Herbicide Free Parks program, we, we used uh, both Roundup as well as uh, other herbicides that, that can be used to, to help manage weeds. Um, there's, there's a different um, levels, according to the EPA, there are different levels of toxicity. Um, and so we've tried to selectively use the lowest toxicity herbicide in order to manage the, the problem in hand. So 
um, Roundup, I believe, is in category three of, of four levels. Um, but there are lower toxicity uh, herbicides um, that can also be uh, considered for use. Thank you, Ms. Nagaya. Councilmember Nash. Thank you. Um, so what? So four hundred thousand dollars to stay herbicide free. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, what? Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> what? Actually, let me first state. I don't. Um, to me, yes, we need to maintain herbicide free. It is such an important. Um, health issue, and especially right now with uh, COVID going on and people with immune, uh, weakened immune systems are more likely to catch COVID, and I believe, and um, certainly if they get COVID are much, um, have poor uh, outcomes. So it's really important um, to stay herbicide free. What I guess I'm trying to understand is what is the $400,000 for? Because it seems like that actually could, um, We could, um, well, what is the $400,000 um, for? The $400,000 is a contract that we um, had put in place in order to um, help manage the parks once the herbicide free program was put in place. And what does that, um, is it, I guess what it seems to me, um, if so is that the four contract workers that you were talking about? Um, they, they have a crew that's larger than four, but when you equate it to um, a full-time equivalent, yes, it's about four okay, and a half. Okay, thank you. Now I understand. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I guess um, my, just, I do not want to go back to herbicides. I want to maintain herbicide free. I'm more willing to, um, to work with the um, reduced um, cleaning at Milan Park and um, the sand hill median is where I'm is where I stand. Thank and, you, and just to be, be clear, the um, the Neilon Park proposal would wouldn't be a reduced cleaning schedule. It would it would be that we do not have staff to clean the park. So the dog owners are responsible to clean the park themselves as always but um, we would not have a staff person able to, to go out and, and do um, targeted cleanup after the use of the dog park each morning. Right, so the dog, I, years ago when, I, um, when my dog was young, um, we, I was a regular at Neilon Park and there was, uh, people were very vigilant about it. It fell off in later years and I don't know what it is like now, um, but they also would collect money so that we got, a professional cleaner um, before sports events. And so I wonder if there's a group, um, at that time there was a group and they could hire someone to, basically I think it is perfectly acceptable to have the responsibility go to the dog owners. And if it doesn't work, then um, we will have to withdraw privileges. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, so a, a quick question, and this may have been covered, and, and I just missed it. And so, like, um, the the four hundred thousand dollars for the uh, herbicide fee free program is is that the price? That's the difference between the 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 herbicide, you know, not free program and the herbicide free program. I'm just trying to get a sense of like what is the actual because they have to maintain be maintained to some extent, and so there is some underlying cost. And so what I want to get is is some understanding of that difference because I am you know in support of what has already been expressed that um, uh, that we should not return to the the to using herbicides um, and so you know even if you said that 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 you know that difference is four hundred thousand dollars I think I, I this is not the a compromise I'm I'm willing to to make um, but. I just want to understand, are we actually talking about $400,000 as a difference, or is there something else? Is there another figure? Now, um, it, it, the contract amount was $400,000. Um, so once that program was, re, was instated a number of years ago, um, I believe it was in 2017 when the city adopted its integrated pest management um, policy, um, 
we added the $400,000 amount to the budget in order to, to annually up the parks maintenance um, in order to, to install the herbicide free parks program. Um, our maintenance workers also used to um, help apply herbicide and so we've then um, uh, been able to, to redirect them to other maintenance tasks, but because of the increased workload on, on the staff, uh, the contract cost was, was the $400,000. So if we were to eliminate the program, um, we would just cancel that contract um, was the, the thinking. So it, it, there was no uh, additional net cost that we were looking okay. to, to add back into the budget. Because the resources that were put towards the, the regular maintenance were redirected, right? And so, um, so you didn't lose them um, in, it, in, in theory, right? They, they sort of re redirected. And so that's why this is just looked as an additional cost um, for, for you. In theory, like if there was a person who was responsible for the maintenance, then you would say, well, that person, maybe we don't need that person anymore. And so um, that person no longer, is no longer employed and the cost of that person um, is then can be subtracted. But that person, and again, I'm, you know, just was redirected, and so then this was just just additional. But but in theory, there were there is there are some underlying costs, right, um, that exist, uh, and 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 it's it for the 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 maintenance and and you know the, the the issue is is that that those costs again, like I say, weren't you know itemized out and were just used for other purposes. So the the parks program. Um has a, a long, long backlog of, of work to be done. And so, yes, we were able to, with the, the addition of the contract, we were then able to do um, other services. But there's also the, the fact that the herbicide free program is resource intensive. And so if we were to reinstate the, um, if we were to eliminate the herbicide free program, I, I don't know that we could, um, eliminate a position and go back to using herbicides like like we did uh, so maybe back up one second we didn't add an FTE at the time we started the herbicide free parks program um, we, we added the contract service so um, so in, in in theory since those you know is my last question on this that those resources have been sort of redirected if the the contract goes away um, then and then so then there is the need for this underlying you know maintenance using the herbicide um where does that come from and then do you have to hire someone you're saying to do that um since there's a backlog and the people who did that have been redirected or does that just get in at the bottom of the list and those people will get to it if and when they get to it yeah, so let me, um, I think the, the use of the word redirected was not, not necessarily appropriate in making this a, a little more, more confusing um, than, than I should have tried to, to explain it. So um, essentially what our staff would have done um, prior to the herbicide free program beginning is that a staff person twice a year would apply herbicides um, to areas where they needed to be to put, put in place. So it's a very fast and efficient process but the ongoing weed maintenance that comes with the herbicide free program requires an additional level of maintenance that, um, that we don't have the staff currently to, to be able to do. So um, I, the, the redirected amount of time is, is so minimal that I, I don't want to, to give you the impression that um, they're, they're out doing lots of playground equipment maintenance and um, doing tasks that aren't really necessary. It's just the, the application of herbicides was a very quick process and so it's a fairly minimal amount of staff time that, that is associated with that. Thank you. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, hi Nikki, I went back and, uh, and I just want to make sure I understand this. In Palo Alto they use herbicides on their playing fields only in an emergency, right? Um, so what, what the uh, information that their staff shared was um, that they were selectively applying herbicides on park uh, sports fields and in their medians. So they they didn't but use I, the term emergency, but um, that that could be the case. Yeah, the term selectively, as my understood it, was an emergency based on whether or not there was uh, something that had gotten out of control and there was a complaint from a 
a number of complaints from um, Palo Alto resident, but that that hadn't happened in a number of years. Did they not go in? They didn't go into it in that much detail. Um, and where I'm kind of coming down this is it may there's some there's it might be worth to do a study session on this at council to really understand this issue better because for some reason you know some there's something that's not translating here for me. I mean I'm not. I mean, maybe is it that they have a higher amount of uh, park staff to begin with? So it's, you know, basically that they, you know, they can get away with, okay, we're going to mow it instead of having to spray, spray it. Like, I don't, I'm just, I'm having a hard time understanding, like, I mean, maybe we should compare the budgets to the parks departments or something like, and maybe that just means that, I mean, but I'm, I'm just having a hard time understanding how they can get away with it have it be a cost savings but for us it's caught it'd be a cost increase and they're already doing it and they're already doing it on their they're already herbicide free on their playing fields unless like they have a soccer tournament coming up and like it's just you got you got to do something really quick so yeah th those are all fair questions we'd have be happy to bring this back um to you for further consideration in the in the coming year but in essence, yes, they they have a higher level of staff support, um, either through contracts or through through staff uh, that manages their program. So we did the comparison um, of the acreage of park uh, uh, park area that they maintain and the number of staff they have uh, employed by the city as well as their contractors, and they cover um, about thirty percent less area today per employee or employee equivalent than what our parks maintenance uh, team and contract support does. And then if we were to impose um, these reductions that are all, all these reductions that are proposed here, um, that would take us to, to closer to 60% more area per FTE equivalent than Palo Alto. So th th that, that is a primary difference in the two programs and how they're um, staffed between the two cities. Um. Does this apply? Are we are we weeding, or are we trying to take out weeds at, Fed, at Federal Bayfront? No, this is a developed park area, and we use developed park area as a that indicator across both agencies. So they have a number of undeveloped kind of passive parks as well, as well as the their golf course. Okay. Councilmember Nash. So yes, it sounds like we all agree that on the herbicide free, and it's just a matter of how to manage the cost there. And I would, um, I wonder if we could ask the Parks and Rec Commission as it becomes activated again, um, if they could brainstorm around perhaps some, um, the field users could have a field cleaning day or something. I know when my kids were playing soccer and baseball and all, we had days when the parents had to help and perhaps this is something that could be added to um could be requested of the sports field users and also um or the school parents or other um, groups that are very interested and the community just generally um, but perhaps the parks and rec department could take a look at i'm sorry parks and rec commission um could take a look and maybe brainstorm ideas to how we might be able to reduce costs and really be able to focus personnel more on the um, meeting, the areas that are not fields and that um, perhaps have the fields covered by the users or and community. Thank you, Councilmember Nash. Councilmember Carlton. Sure. Um, while I think all this is really important, I, I agree with what my colleagues have said. Um, we've just spent 30 minutes on that and we have a lot more to go. Can uh, can I just move that we uh, reduce 300,000, uh, keep 400 for the um, the roundup, and look at how we can uh, make that more cost effective in the uh, in the interim, and and keep moving on because I'm I'm concerned that we need to get through this list. I'm concerned as well, Councilmember Carlton. Thank you for the I, reminder. I, I, Nodding. Is that a second, Betsy? And I do not support any use of Roundup for any reason. I agree. So there's a there's your motion. 
Thank you. So we have a motion by City Council Member Carlton for a 300,000 reduction and are uh, retaining 400,000 for herbicides. And herbicide free. Herbicide free, forgive me. So I'm Thank not you. sure, um, maybe we could have, I think what we're doing is taking $400,000 out because that's what's required for the herbicides and actually cutting the budget by 300,000, right. which is the remaining. Okay. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So you. it's a, it's a cut of 300,000 and a retention of 400,000 for herbicide free. And that was a motion by Carlton and a second. Second by council member Nash by roll call vote. Uh, City Council Member Carlton. Aye, but I wanted to say that that is included in this when we make the minutes with a view to direct staff and the uh, Parks and Rec Commission to determine how to make that a better number in the future. And if they can speak to, they can do research with other groups. That's that's why we have commissions to go off and do things like that to help us. Understood. Minutes will reflect that in the motion. So your vote, Council Member Carlton, with the friendly amendment of direction to staff and park and rec to review. Aye. Thank you, Council Member Mueller. Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Combs. Yes. Mayor Taylor. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heron. So that was one item. So the next item is eliminate night shift overnight of contract custodial services. Okay. Um, and, so, I, and I apologize to, to, to do this, but I just want to make sure that we're, we're clear based on the conversation we just had about the, the level of staffing and the parks program. So the $300,000 that you've authorized does include the layoff of one of our maintenance workers in the parks team and would further reduce our level of um, maintenance um, for the for the park so I, I if that that was your decision and that was clear that's fine I just wanted to make sure that 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 was clear as part of um, the the discussion um, the the amount for the maintenance worker was another hundred thousand dollars of that budget r roughly was there a follow-up question from anyone on council okay just, Thank just you, Mr. Guy. Yep. Okay, going yeah. back to the overnight uh, custodial service. And there was a change to this, and I have a different printout um, from when I printed my agenda from this morning, so something shifted. So I can't see the entire, the entire line item, um, but it says reduction in authorized FTEs. So I'm just going to go by what I have in front of me. Would you like me to give an overview of, of this item? Yes. Well, I just, um, I was the one that wanted to uh, discuss this and, and because thinking about cleaning services, we're reducing it, but yet we um, have a, a, a need, um, an emergency need to clean regularly. So, and I, I, I don't know if it had three full-time um, staff initially, and now it's 2.5. So, I don't know what changed between Tuesday and today. Um, so, the, this proposal is, um, so we, we currently have three um, FTEs that oversee the nighttime custodial contract service that we use to manage and, and clean uh, the city facilities. So. Two of those custodial positions are vacant, and then there is a custodial supervisor that is that is currently filled and, and active. Um, so this proposal was to modify the night shift full-time position to a daytime half-time position in order to still provide oversight of the cl cleaning of the buildings, uh, but not uh, on a real-time basis as the contractor is going through each night. So that's... Um, I think it was a clarification of the net change in FTEs was um, not three positions eliminated, it was two and a half positions eliminated and a half of a position to be maintained. Okay, and has the dollar amount changed? Or is this the same dollar amount that was in the staff report on Tuesday? 
uh, it should be the same dollar amount as what was in the staff report on Tuesday. So if there were three full-time positions and now it's 2.5, so, and the dollar amount hasn't changed. So does, what does that mean? Are we paying the same wage as if we were full-time to part-time? No, it, it just means that the two and a half was not correct. Uh, the three oh. was not correct in the, the prior version of the staff report. Okay, so realistically we had two vacant positions and then one part-time position right now. So the current work that's being done is by uh, someone, um, they're working part-time and not full-time. No, currently there is one full-time person that, that supervises the, the janitorial contractor. Okay, so then the, the, the vacant position was the one and a half time. Uh, sorry, there are two vacant positions. So what, what we right. were proposing here was just to convert that currently active full-time position to a half-time. So the, the net change is uh, to reduce by a half of an FTE. The part that doesn't make any sense to me is that the dollar amount doesn't change if right. we're so converting from a full-time to a part-time. So that's already factored into the dollar amount. Um, we we just caught between the staff report on Tuesday and this version that uh, the net reduction in FTEs was was more correct to show uh, two and a half instead of three. But the budget does account for the change in uh, the position from a full time position to a half time of a position. Okay. In the interest of time, can we? move past this one. I don't want to vote on it right now. I, I would like to go back and look at the staff report from Tuesday, if no one minds. Thank you. So the next item is 176, reduce tree maintenance capacity and forego implementation of new heritage tree ordinance requirement. Yeah, so this item is, um, a two-fold proposal. One is roughly a $50,000 reduction in the contract uh, service that we use to help trim and maintain city street trees. Uh, so roughly, right, right now we maintain uh, tree trimming on a five-year cycle. That This reduction would result in increasing that frequency um, to a seven-year cycle. And then the second part of the uh, proposal is to uh, consider foregoing the um, new heritage tree ordinance requirements, and that's uh, roughly $120,000 of the, the $170,000 that's shown here. So it's a two two different elements for um, related to the tree program. Councilmember Nash. So could you reconcile that um, the part, not the heritage tree? Um, ordinance part, but the tree trimming, I thought that we last meeting just approved um, the tree tree trimming fees. And so how does that reconcile with this? Because if we're collecting the money, we should be using it since it's not. So the, the landscape assessment district is what you saw on, on Tuesday evening. And part of, part of the challenge that, that we're working towards here is the the crunch before the end of the fiscal year. And so mm -hmm. um, the initial proposal, um, when we first brought forward um, the recommendations, we would have had time to factor that into what was presented in the Landscape Assessment District report, um, but we're, we're just past that point in time now. So we will have to go back and, and resolve the difference in service levels. Um, the TREE program is generally, um, is, is overall, it's funded by both the assessment fees as well as a contribution from the general fund each year. And then through those different um, funds, we pay the contract service to uh, go out and trim the trees. So this proposal was to reduce that contract service. We will have to go back and resolve the um, assessment amounts and uh, the general fund contribution if this um, proposal was to be enacted as part of the budget. And is it possible, given the economy, to um, when you're going back and talking to the tree company, to possibly renegotiate the cost, and so we're not reducing for as quite as much? 
Um, so we, we can do that. We, we are subject to paying uh, the state required prevailing wage for, for tree workers. And so that's generally what they base their cost on. Um, on a, okay, that on makes an sense. Basis. Enough said. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So, so I, I guess my concern is that um, as part of the climate action plan, that'll be um, one of the things we need to do is have more trees and more mature trees. So um, while I cannot argue for this at this point, given the cuts we have, are making, I just want to be um, really aware and try and um, have as much tree trimming as is possible um, when you reconcile with the uh, landscape ordinance, uh, landscape assessment, and just do whatever we can to preserve our trees and perhaps um, try and work with a nonprofit such as Canopy or um, some group to do whatever we can to save our tree canopy. Thanks. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, so I uh, agree with um, everything Councilmember Nash said. <clears throat> you know, as I, you guys are aware, I was chair of the uh, Heritage Street Ordinance um, Committee and, and spent a number of nights uh, there debating with fellow residents um, about what, what would be the best future direction and changes to the ordinance. So very much committed to its implementation. Um, but, um, you know, I'm supportive of this remaining on the list for being cut. Again, given the larger, you know, um, you know, scenario that 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 we're dealing with, I, I don't see how um, 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 I could sort of advocate for pulling pulling this off at this at this point. Um, Are there any thoughts on this? Other thoughts on this item, Councilmember Carlton? All right, I, you know, this is where it's really difficult because it's something that we've worked on and it's something that's important, uh, but we're cutting other things that are difficult and important. Um, I wouldn't be happy about cutting it, uh, but if we, if I would vote to postpone it because it's not in the grand scheme of things critical uh, that we do it right now. Um, and I say that with a lot of reservations because it's it's something that I've supported. But um, if if we have to be tough and we really have to balance a budget, I can see this being something that we postpone. As I said, I'm not happy about it, but I, I could postpone this one. Councilmember Mueller, did you have any thoughts on this item? Yeah, I think, I mean, we had a system that was worked that didn't work great before, but it worked. So I'm fine with postponing it. I think once we have the money again, we can implement it. And it's a lot of great work. It's ready to go. But I think we need to, you know, we have to make cuts right now. Thank you. Council Member Nash. I guess just listening to my colleagues um, and Vice Mayor. Combs may be the best person to come. Actually, I don't even know that there's a comment on this, but just if there's anything from the Heritage Tree Ordinance, such as the replacement policy or something that does not cost extra money but could be brought forward, um, that would be of interest to me. But it's let's get through this first. But just there may be pieces that um, are an easy add to the current policy or an easy fix to the current policy that might help our tree canopy. So is there a motion for number 176? Thank you, Ms. Heron. And I, su I support postponing it. So again, when we speak of postponing, it is to leave it on the list to be cut. Is that correct? Okay, so that is a motion yes. by Council Member Nash. Can I have a second? 
A second. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. By roll call vote, Council Member Carlton. Aye. Council Member Mueller. Council Member Nash. Aye. Vice Mayor Combs. Yes. Mayor Taylor. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Okay, the next number is 177, roll back temporary staffing capacity for special capital and regional coordination projects. Council Member Nash. So I don't know if um, there's gonna be any presentation from Ms. Nagaya, but essentially I feel really strongly about this, that we've got some um, engineering projects and transportation projects with the uh, middle rail crossing, the underground and utilities, the Bellhaven Community Center and library and um, coordination with San Francisco Creek that have been, um, well, certainly speaking about the middle um, middle rail crossing and the undercrossing. Those have been um, moved around among various staff members with um, as we have had um, staff changes. And I think they're incredibly important to the city. And we actually have an opportunity to um, really push on these. I know that some um, the current individuals um, working uh, on the project are looking at grants and have really been able to push this project forward, especially since um, Ms. Abisa left, which was a huge um, loss. And I would strongly, um, I feel very strongly that we should leave this as is um, and not further um, delay these projects, especially in light of how many um, numerous cuts we've already made in the transportation department, which I think will further hinder um, anything we want to do. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, thanks. Uh, totally here, Councilmember Nash on this. So just if someone, Councilmember Nash or someone on staff walk me through, like this cost is associated with two contract or temporary positions, correct? Um, so they are, actually, I'll let Ms. Nagaya speak. Sure. Um, so the, the, this budget is associated with staff um in two temporary positions so we have two um uh staff members who came to us as retired public works directors from other agencies who've been helping advance um these kind of more complex projects um that require a lot of um, regional coordination so the the middle crossing is one um additionally supporting the the city's uh work with the San Francisco Creek JPA as well um, is one of the, the other components. Just just a moment. I want to go back to Vice Mayor Combs's question, if you could re-ask it, if you don't mind. Oh, oh um, or was yeah. it just a statement? No, my, well, Ms. Nagai was, was answering the question and it, it was just that to uh, confirm what this cost is associated with and it is the salaries of two sort of contract, contract positions. Um, um, th that's what I, I wanted to confirm. And so then, again, my concern is just that in, um, you know, this moment where we are um, laying off or forlorning FTEs, um, I, I don't know how that sort of narrative works with us then keeping, uh, um, you know, fairly decently compensated, you know, temporary hires. Um, or contract hires, and, and so I, I, I just, you know, um, not just for me is is a concern that it, is there someone among those that would be sort of um, um, th that would possibly be laid off that could say like, well, I can do this, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm here as an FTE, I could take this this project on. And so again, that that would that would be my my concern, but I share a council members Nash. Um, concern about the importance of, of these projects and even the value of it you know at least one of these individuals i've interacted with um a number of times and and to your point mr guy very senior level people 
um, um, no, no doubt about that, and, and what, what's clearly needed for, for, for these projects. But, but I do, I do have that that concern. Um, I, I would be willing to, um, um, to, to have this removed from the, the elimination list. All that being said, Councilmember Nash. Well, I was um, actually Vice Mayor Combs um, ended up saying these are very senior level people who are working across multiple agencies and jurisdictions, and it seems, um, and so I think have a special um, have special experience, and they have. Um, I believe they're coming directly to us, and I know at least one of them is a Menlo Park resident, so has um, specific knowledge of Menlo Park in addition to the engineering and public works expertise, so that they're extremely valuable on these important projects, um, these specific individuals. Thank you. Councilmember Carlton. I agree that it needs to come off. We've got too much writing on, on this and on various levels. Um, it sounds like we are in agreement, keeping to move this on. Do you, if you if you make a motion, Betsy, I'll second it, and let and then we can see if there's any final discussion before we vote. Thank you. I move to um, remove the number 177, roll back temporary staffing capacity for special capital and regional coordination projects from the list um, of budget cuts. I second. Thank you. By a roll call vote, Council Member Carlton. Council Member Mueller. Would you like further discussion, Council Member Mueller? I'm just, can you just, I just don't understand, guys. Like, you want to keep this on. What was the, what's the one factor that makes you think you want to keep this on? What's the one reason why why this comes off? I should say why you don't want to cut it. I would. I mean, I'll, I'll let everyone chime in for for themselves. But um, you know, the Middle Avenue crossing is a in and of itself is 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 a key project of which. Um, okay, so it's no. Middle, okay, okay, it's so middle and what else? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think for, for for me, I, I think that is that project, the the importance of it, the 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 crosstown connectivity, and all of you know the um, um, all of the the efforts over over the years, if not decades, um, that have been put into this issue. I, I feel that like it may come at a point in the not too distant future, like three months from now or six months from now. Where the situation is dire, where I was, where I my, my thinking might change, but at this moment I'm not completely. If staff is saying that these individuals are key, like play a key role in in, in seeing that you know that specific project moving along, um, I'm I'm willing to sort of give it that time and say, okay, again, just because everything everything connected to that to, to that project, all of the history, all of the close getting close but then not not getting it done and, and every time we sort of miss this it comes around five years later and it's millions of more dollars um and so again that's for me but i'll, I'll let everyone speak to themselves that's, but I, uh, I i share yeah i just have i'll, I'll vote for it to support you guys but i have concerns on this one that we can't handle it in-house and we just severely i mean we really we really cut our police department this is one of the things that I would have balanced on, like to keep con contract workers for this. So I'm having a hard time with that, but I'll support you guys on this because Ms. Nagaya, you, you came on, I think you want to speak on it. Yeah, I, I was just going to offer, um, so the council could also consider a reduction in this budget and not eliminating it completely. If, if that's something that would be more comfortable, um, we could still then provide support for for key projects it would just be at a a lesser level um so we could take that proposal back and um, reconsider as well uh, ultimately the projects that are identified in this category 
we would shift resources around to keep them moving um, regardless of what you decide. Um, and, and the two individuals that are in the positions are, are very valuable, but all of our staff are also very valuable. So um, I, I just want to make sure that we acknowledge with the trade-off discussion that, that you're, uh, in refer you're referencing, an alternative could be a, a reduction in this budget as, as well. So that, that was all. Councilmember Carlton. Yeah, I, I want to keep this budget because we're talking about things that are on a timeline and we lose a lot of money if we miss it. You know, we we have a certain period of time where we have to do the undercrossing. We have a period of time where we, we're working on Bellhaven Community Center and it impacts people's lives as well uh, for the extra time that it takes us to get these things done. And when the creek needs to get done, the creek needs to get done. We're, we're one part of a, a cog. And, and and that also has to do with health and safety for God forbid uh, another flood. So I'm I'm actually comfortable keeping this because I think these are are key uh, health and safety as 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 well as fiscally responsible to keep them moving on various levels. So that's why I support it. Like I like I like I said, guys, I'll support it. Just I'll support this one. Um, and, and, and I uh, echo Council Member Carlton. I'll just say that if staff does want, again, this is not the final time we're seeing all this. If staff does want to come back with a, a more economical approach um, to this, then I'm, I'm certainly willing to to hear it and see it. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. So do so, we have a, go ahead, Ms. Harris. Just for uh, clarification, is that a council consensus for staff to come back with uh, alternates and still retaining to uh, remove this from the list to be cut? Just nods will be fine. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, the motion by Nash is second by Carlton is to remove this item from the list and direct staff to still return to council with um, uh, other alternatives, uh, cost saving alternatives. And I have a uh, this was vote. seconded by Drew Combs, I believe. Oh, thank you very much for clarifying. Um, so by roll call vote, Councilmember Carlson, Councilmember Mueller, Councilmember Nash, Vice Mayor Combs, uh, yes, Mayor Taylor, yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Heron. Hello, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, Madam Mayor, if I may, uh, since we have completed the public works section, I wanted to give the City Council an update on where we are so far. Um, at this point, the City Council has identified 9.93 million in net reductions, uh, which leaves approximately 3.57 million uh, to go um, in order to reach the uh, balanced budget um, through whatever means the Council desires. Um, I will caveat that by saying that is uh, taking into account what we anticipate the additional uh, child care needs to be. Um, and on that point, as we move into the community services category, uh, staff would recommend that City Council defers discussion uh, on child care until the June 9th meeting. This will allow staff to do further analysis on the financials and the uh, reopening plan for child care. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Um, I have a, a question um, that pool maintenance or the operational acts of, aspect of the pool, would that be under public works or would that be under the, in another department? Uh, so that one actually falls in a couple departments. I would say that the primary department for that one would be community services though. Okay. And minus the child care, we still have items on our community services list. That is correct, yes. Okay. If you'll give me just a moment, I will scroll the list down.
Roxanne, can you confirm that we are starting with number 178? I believe that is where we ended. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay, item number 178, Oneta Harris Center remains closed until completion of the new community center and library. And just based on impacts and assumptions, it says reduces access to recreation programs. And so if it's not my mistaken, I may be mistaken, but we passed a resolution that said that we would not exacerbate um, anything related to COVID-19 um, and limiting access or reducing access to uh, communities that are, are considered vulnerable. So I see cutting this from our budget as, as doing the opposite of what our intent is. So which is why I pulled this item from the cut list. Vice Mayor Combs. So if someone um, uh, on staff could come and walk me through this. So the uh, Oneta Harris will, will have to close or the plan is for it to close in December, right? Or at the end of the year, correct? No, no matter what. And so what we're talking about is uh, a date that's not yet clear when in theory it can open back up for operation in in the end of in the end of December, correct? Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member uh, Council Member Combs. Um, I, I think I can answer your question there just to clarify the timing. Um, so the the we are expecting um, we were expecting to close the community center. Um, in de or after December originally as part of the construction um, for the new BHCCL. So that is that is correct. Um, and so that's essentially why really the main reason for why this proposed cut is 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 here um, is in light of the fact that we are going to be closing the facility um, at the end of this calendar year. Uh, the services would be uh, included as part of our transitional services program, um, which I believe the council has weighed in on on transitional services. And I and currently right now we're, we have identified transitioning those services over to the uh, community center on the Burgess campus, the Ariaga Family Recreation Center. And so um, that's essentially one of the reasons why this is even being proposed. Yeah, totally fair. Thanks for that that background. So as I'm approaching, it's it's hard for me to argue um, for this not to remain on the list to be cut because um, we're talking about a very specific short time frame, and it's it's in in uh, and it's not clear when it will be able to to open. And even when it opens up, there's going to be very clear COVID nineteen related protocols that that have to be very bespoke to a, a specific place. And so that there all has to be an engagement about like how that is specifically rolled out. And so it seems like to me for all of that, it, it's a lot of investment for something that that where the shelf life is 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 limited um, in, in either scenario where we could be looking at at like, I mean, this could in, to some issue to some extent be a non-issue. Um, you know, um, and and so that for me it, it it's hard for, for me again because you know, essentially what this does is it, it sort of moves up this transition um, that Mr. Swigert has, has has talked about of, of like having the staff fully um, devote uh, its resources to like how these services are going to be delivered on the Burgess campus, which for the, the sort of, which is where it's going to be delivered for, for, for a couple of years or however long it takes for the new community center to be, um, uh, to, to be built. And so that's where I stand on this. I am, I am, remain open um, to someone sort of uh, convincing me otherwise, but as I see it, um, it it's, um, you know, again, it, it, it's a lot to invest uh, in, in a facility where the, the shelf life is, is very limited. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. Um, just a follow-up, Mr. Swaggart. So sure. the, if, 
if the community center opened up on June 1st. So the cost from June 1st to December 1st for the city to run the community center is $344,000. Uh, no, that's not that's not correct. Um, so the the this the the pro proposed reduction right now assumes that the community center doesn't open. Oh, um, you bring up a good point. Actually, no. This would be what would be considered a full year's worth of reduction, um, okay. with, which is what you're seeing in the proposal right now. Um, so any number of things. I appreciate um, Councilmember Combs um, uh, articulating. Oh, uh, sorry. Vice Mayor Combs um, uh, articulating uh, that regarding the time frame. What we don't know is about stage three, when that's supposed to occur, occur and when we can reopen the facilities. If we do get, um, uh, if we find out that we can reopen our community centers earlier in stage three, and we wish to do so at all of the locations, including Odetta Harris, um, we would just have to, re we'd have to take a look and retool uh, the budget proposal you're seeing here, if, if the council desired. Okay, I, I appreciate the the clarity. So the dollar amount that's on here is for 12, 12 month. That is keep... correct. Okay, thank you. That's assuming, yeah, for for uh, Madam Mayor, that's for for the whole fiscal year uh, next year. Correct. Thank you, Council Member Mueller. Eric is the. Is the uh, community center uh, a designated uh, cooling uh, cooling location? The uh, Oneta Harris Community Center is uh, designated as a cooling center. We uh, we have two uh, designated centers, not counting the library. Um, so the Ariaga Rec Center, Oneta Harris, and the library uh, main library are all cooling centers. So that's the only cooling center for vulnerable populations. Uh, on the, uh, but it's not open. But, but let me finish because it's not open now. But what uh, I want to get to is, uh, have we had any discussion? So and we can't. So this is a. What I'm trying to see here is if we can get any Category B money through San Mateo County and the state to cover it, to cover it being open if when we need it. So so can so I have a. What I'm concerned about so. It may be possible that we can take some of the budget that's required for this and actually get it from the county and state because we need it for our vulnerable populations through the summertime of heat because it's a large space where you can have social distancing and where people can use it as a cooling center. If we take away this budget and close it and, and we don't have it available for that purpose, during our, our hot summer months, we're putting people at risk. Because, uh, so, you know, I I actually would like to see more work go into this item, because I think that uh, with talking to the county uh, before it comes to us on June 9th, because this location is a critical location for vulnerable populations for what's coming in the summertime. It just is. It's going to be super. It's going to be super hot this summer, and we already saw a little glimpse of it right now. And with the pandemic happening on top of it, you need cooling. You you need adequate space to be able to social distance people who are who are also going to be, who frankly, you know, most of the people who are seeking that type of shelter are already in a vulnerable population group. Yeah. Council so, Member Mueller. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Council Member Mueller. I just in your your regarding the cooling uh, centers, I was a miss. Um, we do have both the Bellhaven Branch Library has also served as a cooling station there uh, as well. Um, we have designated Oneta Harris um, to be that facility. Um, we would still, um, obviously, we still have the operation with the senior center facility at least through through the end of this year. Um, I do um, think it is going to be important, however, um, when we begin construction for the BHCCL. Um, that we identify alternative locations for cooling stations in the, in in the Bellhaven neighborhood. Absolutely need to do that. Right. Well, then if you if you have others in Bellhaven besides this for cooling, and you think it's adequate, then that's a different story. So, but is it? I don't know. I I canly don't know what how many people utilize the cooling stations. But remember, the cooling stations are going to be have to be adequately social distanced. This 
Absolutely. I think we had a total of about 16 people that took advantage of it last summer, but it's not to say that we wouldn't have a higher turnout uh, this summer because, frankly, cooling stations were fairly new last year um, in terms of our implementation, so we may get a bigger turnout and need for it. So You are absolutely going to get a bigger turnout because this is what's not going to be, but this is what the difference is going to be is this year, you're not going to have movie theaters for people to go to. You're going to have limited access to indoor malls. All those places, are, you're not going to have any offices. Like all those places that people go, or you're not, you're, you may not have as much restaurant capacity that has air conditioning. All those places people go in the public to get cooled off, they're not going to have. And so uh, they're really going to be, people are going to be looking for help. There are two, uh, another space, which would be the neighborhood service center. Um, just thinking about the size of it, it's pretty small. Um, it's supposed to be a community serving space, but it isn't open. Um, and also the 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 school library um, is a small space as well. So if you add up the square footage that there, um, it definitely doesn't equal the square footage at the community center, um, but it is uh, it's something that can be open. Um, I believe that Councilmember Nash had her hand up. Thank you. Um, I actually really appreciate your comments, Council Member Mueller. Um, Mayor Taylor and I, for the last few days, have been trying to figure out cooling stations in the city and um, with City Manager Jerome Robinson, and we have come up empty handed. So I'm really happy to hear that this is a possibility. Um, and I think it's something where we definitely need to be looking at cooling stations. Uh, across the city, realizing that it will be tough in this, um, given the COVID restrictions. I'd go to the county and specifically ask them for Cat B Monday, Cat B Monday, Cat B money through the state from FEMA. It's a conversation that's taking place right now everywhere. Um, Mr. Swaggart, I have a, um, a question um, or something that I'm, I'm interested in. And that is how to, and maybe you can help figure out how to get there. And that is a part of our contract with the pools. Um, we cover operational expenses um, and also some maintenance. I don't have a dollar amount for that. Do you have an idea of what that costs the city a year? Yeah, um, Madam Mayor, um, I actually sent uh, an email. I believe I responded an email. Hopefully that. Uh, went to our city manager in response to um, council member Nash's question about that. Um, I was actually, for some reason, I was trying to pull up that email that I sent um, and I'm having difficulty with my computer with everything running and stuff like that. So um, council member Nash, did you by chance have that info? So when was this sent? I don't believe I received it. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It it actually was. Um, I was. Um, I believe I was responding to our assistant city manager, um, who uh, knew that this information was requested. So if you can just bear with yeah. me for just one second, I'll pull it up. Okay. Um, all right, so I have the numbers here, and so, um, so Madam Mayor, um, you're just asking for expenses um, that we are responsible for for each of the two pools. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we'll start with Bellhaven Pool. Um, in um, and I have a full year worth of data. Um, I think that's probably the most useful. But a full year's worth of data for Bellhaven Pool in the 1819 are actuals. Um, our total expenses were 252,000. We did receive the funds, um, the, the revenues that we received from, from Facebook for 60,000. So a net cost to the city at 192,000. Um, that was what the city bared as far as the cost goes for Bellhaven Pool. Um, and the adopted budget was is, is being estimated slightly lower. That's current year 1920. And that's just the way we, um, this distribute the, the expenses for chemicals, for instance. Um, we, we made some adjustments with that. And so our net cost, given with revenues and expenses for this year, we would have projected to be around 160,000. And that's like things like maintenance and repairs, chemicals, 
um, and utilities, because utilities and chemicals are the biggest cost for operating pools um, in terms of in terms of uh, non-personnel expenses, but we're not responsible for those. Um, for Burgess, um, in 1819, the expense actuals were around 370,000. Um, we received revenue, um, shared revenue of 24,000, approximately with a net cost of 345,000. Um, this year, we were projecting expenses at Burgess at 422,000, revenue at 30,000, with a net cost of 392. Again, usually what ends up happening many times is our nets end up um, shaking out better. So hopefully those numbers uh, that answers your question. Yes, it yes it does, and that's so that's operational and maintenance. Uh, oper we 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 for for our purposes operational expenses are maintenance um those are all the things that we're responsible for what this doesn't include is any money set aside for capital investment in the pools and th essentially we own the pools so anytime we make a major improvement this these numbers do not include that okay thank you mr swaggard council member nash you have a question um, so thank you. That's exactly what I was interested in. Um, so these are the numbers for the people to clean the pool, because I know that we're, I believe we're responsible for the maintenance of the pool. Is that correct? correct? Council Member Nash. Correct. We, we, so that we includes the new agreement, correct? Okay, but it does not, because today I was looking at CIP items um, with staff and there is four hundred thousand dollars in the budget for an annual um cip for the pool okay. so that means in addition to these costs we are now we also pay four hundred thousand dollars obviously depends what we spend of it but we allocate four hundred thousand dollars in addition of yeah, the city think, taxpayer money to the pools yeah i think i think to, to differentiate those it's it's kind of like a, an investment fund because we know that the lifespan of the pools are limited and things are going to break. And so, um, you know, so we've been putting money aside, the council will approve setting money aside each year so that when we have major repairs to the pool in order to maintain the lifespan of the pool, um, that's what those monies are for. And like in any given year, we may spend little or nothing um, from, from those funds, or we may have a major repair um where like we did a heating project uh we had to replace a heater for Burgess pool for instance uh and some other projects so that was like over a hundred thousand or something and so but those it, it's just basically to make sure that we put money aside for when um there needs to be replacement and I'm i and i would say that my very honestly i i'm speechless i because anyway okay so i think this is something that we should discuss at some other point it's sure um, um, council member nash i think it's important to know about pools is the pools are a very expensive operation um pools exist in all municipalities they are not um and pools are not there for for frankly making money and they don't generate they they are highly subsidized uh investments um if cities were operating the pools themselves um not only would we have all the personnel costs related to doing that but then we also have the maintenance costs on top of that, uh, which is substantial. Um, and so as community services programs, when you look at programs that are high um, subsidy from, from the city, seniors are right there, you know, teens are right there, and then pools are like right in that same category of services. Thank you, Mr. Swaggart. Uh, one of the reasons why I asked this question is because if if I can get um, support from the council, um, I would love to see the contract that we have renegotiated. Uh, the numbers that you just um, gave me, I mean, it's close to a million dollars. Um, so and that's not a small amount of funds. If it was 100,000 or 200,000, but nearly a million dollars. So yeah, if, if it if just um, I don't know if anybody else on council has any input on that um, so that way we don't have to spend too much time more on this item um, but that was the reason why I brought it up council member Carlton sure I've, I've negotiated this contract twice or at least been around when it was being negotiated first time on parks and rec and in the research that we did we found that most cities are are as uh, mr. Schweiger said massively uh supporting the pool subsidizing the pool 
and uh, the agreement that we had at least initially uh, with Tim Sheeper, um, basically it, it benefited the city tremendously in finances compared to what it would have been otherwise. Um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't look at it again. Um, certainly now that everything has changed, uh, he might want to look at it again too. Uh, but I just wanted to, to point out that uh, at least in, in the, the two iterations of this coming through that I've seen, it, it has actually saved the city money uh, more so than it would have done had we not had the agreement. And, and uh, generally, uh, it saves the city money and people love uh, the swimming program as we've seen with a lot of the, the emails. Um, he, he seems to run it from, from what I've seen, he seems to run it very well. Uh, so anyway, I was just going to put that in there. Uh, I don't mean to, to delay us because I know we're, we're running late and we need to keep it moving on. Thank you. Councilmember Nash, did you have your hand up earlier? If not, we will move on. I'll, I'll wait till further on. I'm fine. So in regards to item 178, do we have a motion on the table or is there further discussion? Councilmember Nash. Hi, I'm sorry, thank you. I remembered what I was um, going to ask and hopefully this will be really quick, but um, we currently have two um, benefited employees working at the Oneta Harris Community Center. What my question is, is um, whether they have, um, whether there will be any opportunity for them to work over at Ariaga or whether they automatically are, um, if we, depending what we decide on this item, we haven't decided yet, um, how their, um, how that works, whether if they're more senior than someone at one of the other centers, do they have, um, does the union, do they fall under the union's ability to bump other people off or are they automatically because they're at Ariaga, I'm sorry, at um, Annetta Harris, do they fall into a different category? In other words, I guess, are, they, are the positions by facility or are, by they, are they by position? So, Council Member Nash, I try to answer your question. So the, the, the cuts that are listed in there with the, the budget expenses you see do involve uh, 1.75 FT, which is two, basically it's two people that are currently in positions. I can't speak to the, the bumping rights or seniority aspect. Um, that will be something I think that um, our HR division will need to figure out how that works out. Um, you know, when we, one thing to be very clear, it, it's never a priority or never a first choice to ever impact staff. Um, these are all valuable staff. Um, we want to keep them. We need them. Um, I will say that um, with um, the new Bellhaven Community Center and Library, it's very essential that we maintain these positions. We'll need every position we can possibly have. The, the proposed reduction that you do see there does involve a layoff. Um, of, of two personnel, it's 1.75 FTE. That's where the largest um, cost savings are in that proposed budget. Um, I would have to take a look at the numbers if it didn't include those two positions. Um, the other factor is prior to um, going through this beginning of this budget process, when we were looking at transitional services or many options for transitional services, um, we were looking at many different ways of delivering those. And at no time did we ever um, consider um, reducing staff um, at all, um, depending on the scenario we were going to provide. Um, and so I just wanted to just speak to that briefly. I guess I was just within the department, do you consider um, positions by utility, um, by facility or by, um, by hmm. position level? Uh, the these these positions are designated based on a program base. It's uh, so it's it's attached to the services and the facility itself. That's, okay, thank I, you. That's a question. Okay. And the, just one last question, um, Mr. Swaggart, that came up with 
after um, Betsy's question, and that is, were there any, is, is there an opportunity to freeze or furlough any of these positions? Um, um, I, I think I'm going to have to defer to um, our assistant city manager um, with that. Um, I do believe that um, there are options. I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with what a furlough means versus freezing. I would definitely say that um, we want to absolutely freeze the positions. I don't want to lose the FTEs because we will need them. Um, in terms of furloughing, um, I don't know the specifics. In either case, it's going to involve a layoff. The question is, what does it look like? Um, and and if you need further details on that, I think that there's probably somebody who can come on who's uh, who could probably speak better to it than I can. Thank you, Mr. Swagger. Hello, Mr. Pigueros. Hi, Madam Mayor, Council. Um, the, as a matter of uh, preparing next year's budget, we will at some point ask the council or whether, or make a recommendation to council of whether to um, get out of the business of doing something which would uh, effectively be a full on layoff and elimination of the position. Or if uh, due to operational considerations, uh, it makes sense to uh, close the program for a period of time, whether it be a quarter, half a quarter, however long, and lay off the individual, but it's actually a furlough, uh, which would infer that uh, the city has an intent to bring the project, the program back, um, and that the individual who held the position would uh, be rehired when the program or would be offered to be rehired uh, when the program re is restored. And so I, I think that through all of this, uh, the layoffs are, as I think the council has shared a number of times, layoffs are uh, the last resort uh, that we want to go down. Um, there have been, uh, we have been working with our labor units to uh, identify options that may help with that situation. Uh, we don't have agreements yet with that, but uh, the ability to furlough or to temporarily uh, close a program may be necessary regardless of whether we uh, reach um, any agreements or are able to identify savings elsewhere. And those are really the programs that uh, by virtue of the services provided cannot be provided currently due to the COVID-19 restrictions. I hope yes. that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. So the, the actual dollar amount um, for this item on the budget is $172,000, not the 344000 um, So uh, I think the, the important consideration here is that we are working on a baseline budget, was, which is a 12-month budget. Um, we are moving forward with the uh, Bellhaven Community Center and Library project, which was scheduled to have the facilities closed uh, no later than the end of the year. Um, mm -hmm. That project, uh, if it moves forward, then the actual uh, realized savings would be half of the number uh, listed on this on the um, on the worksheet. Uh, so yes, if however, I just do want to highlight that we're working on a baseline budget, so we do look at the 12 month number. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pagaro. Is there anything else on this item? Is anyone is anyone ready to make a motion? Councilmember Nash. Uh oh. Well, I'm really um as with other cuts heartbroken to make it but i move that we um that the anetta harris community center remains closed until completion of the bellhaven project um hoping that something changes that that's um the move and i guess i would um like to make um to make sure that the um when possible that Ariaga is opened and that there's a shuttle run between the Bellhaven, the Anetta Harris Center and Ariaga and that any sliding um, 
any fee schedule is adjusted to reflect what the fee schedule was at the Annetta Harris Center. So, well, basically that, or there's a sliding scale so that um, no one is turned away for fees. So the motion on the floor by city council member Nash is to keep number 178 on the list as a cut. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Combs. By roll call vote, Council Member Carlton. Aye. Council Member Mueller. Is here from Cecilia where you are on this? I, I don't support cutting it. So, and I mean, I'd look at the budget, it's $300,000 a year to run this community center. That's not a huge um, operational expense. Uh, even though the community is looked at as being vulnerable, the community members that own homes pay taxes as well, um, and they need service as well. And to rely on a shuttle um, that if you've ever wrote, written a shuttle in Menlo Park, um, usually they cancel uh, one of the times yeah. that they provide service. Is so having service? access is going to be reduced significantly. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, I was gonna say is the, the, sen the, the senior center, refresh my recollection, is, is still open or closed? The senior center is still is still closed at the moment, and I'm not sure what the plan so, is for that. All right, I'll be I'll, I'm going to support uh, I'm going to support the mayor. I'll move on now. Thank you. Thank you. City Council Member Nash. Uh, yes. Yeah. City Council Member Carlton, have I reported your vote? I said aye. Thank you. Vice Mayor Combs? Yes. And Mayor Taylor? No. And the motion passes with Mayor Taylor and City Council Member Mueller dissenting. And that will bring us to the next item on the list, which is 179. Okay, 179 is the Bellhaven pool remains closed until completion of the new community center and library. Are there any thoughts on this item? And I believe that uh, Ms. Silver, I'm not sure if everyone received the email regarding the funding um, that comes from Facebook on this one. Council Member Mueller. I was gonna say with both facilities closed, I'm not sure how wide it is to keep it open. So uh, I'm, uh, but I'm just interested to hear thoughts on it. Council Member Nash. I actually, um, the pools are opening and I would um, vote for removing this from the table. I think it's something that um, is very valuable for the community and I would actually um, suggest having priority for Bellhaven residents and then for Menlo Park residents. Um, I think that with people home um, sheltering in place that the pool may be a real refuge this year and um, I'd like to keep it on if we possibly can. Council Member Carlton. You're on mute. I'm sorry. I had a question for staff. I was under the impression that it was an underutilized pool so that uh, prioritization wasn't necessary. Uh, so I just wanted to ask staff uh, what the, the use was like. Uh, I know it's going to be different during COVID, but as of like last summer is an indication. Is staff there to tell us about the utilization of the pool? Mr. Swagger, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Council Member Carlton, thank you for your question. Um, the Bellhaven pool in, in in comparison to the Burgess pool is, uh, I would say underutilized. Um, so it does see a, a, a 
not nearly as much uh, attendance and traffic as our Burgess pool does. Um, however, um, because of accessibility issues and so forth and having that available to the community um, has, has spoke well to that. Um, I did, since you did pull me on to this discussion, again, uh, I did want to mention um, that, you know, the, the proposal that you see, again, is for an entire fiscal year. Um, I do realize, you know, when we were putting these proposals together, um, it was, you know, earlier when we had everything closed, it was before we knew pools would potentially reopen. And, uh, and we have been told now that the county has said that we can reopen. Um, and so it, it really will depend on the council's direction on this, um, but potentially um, the, the, proposal that the proposal that you have is for a full year. Um, short of that, it may reduce it. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I have Council a follow-up Council. question then on that. Once full construction starts, uh, is it possible for the pool to remain or is the, this, when they're going to full construction, is the pool going to have to close anyway? The, 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 my, as my understanding that all of the facilities there on the, that campus there, including the pool, would have to um, shutter um, for construction. And when, when do we expect that to start? Um, we, we were, we were uh, for planning for January or somewhere thereof, but we wanted to have all of the transitional and services in place by the end of the year with everything shut by that point. So by okay. the end of the year. So we're not cutting 209. If we leave it open till December, uh, it would be 100,000. Correct. It would be half of that. Okay. I would like to 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 keep this, but I'd like to adjust the uh, the budget to more accurately reflect what the real impact of that would be, because I think it is going to be important, especially as we have a hot summer for people to have a place to cool down. So I'd like to keep it uh, at one hundred thousand dollars. Is that possible? Are you good with that? Um, uh, council Member Carlton, I would have to refer to all the other council on on that decision. But um, I'm, I'm I'm asking you if if you think that's the same number. I mean, if it's going to be closed anyway in January because of building, we leave it on there. We're not doing a two hundred thousand dollar hit to the budget. We're doing a one hundred thousand dollar budget. I'm just bringing I'm, I'm bringing to the level of reality, and I'm asking if you agree to that. Yeah, the 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 I think your estimates are close, at least. Okay, so if it's only going to be a hundred thousand dollars, and it really helps people have a a place to exercise and cool down, I would keep it. Well, and that value would actually be only forty thousand because sixty thousand comes from Facebook. The 40, and this is also underutilized. <laughs> the pool is underutilized because of the hours of operation. And more people use the community center that use the pool. Councilmember so Mueller. $40,000, keep it. So, yeah, so I think it's gonna be more than 40,000 though, because I think that there's gonna be, you're, you're gonna be using it during a pandemic, so there'll be stuff that will be required, but it's not gonna be a lot, it's not gonna be, it should be a lot more. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with keeping it and not leaving it on the list. I just think what we're, um, I am not supportive though, of giving priority to one type of resident or another. I don't think we want to start going down that road. So I don't think that's appropriate at all. I don't think it would be appropriate the other way either. So public public facilities are for are public facilities. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Uh, Ms. Silver, did you need to speak before Councilmember Nash? I can hold my comment. Okay, Councilmember Nash. Actually, I decided not to comment, so that's fine. So I, I just wanted to remind the council of an earlier action that you had taken to terminate the Haven um, operator agreement with Tim Sheeper, and so that um, so the operator agreement will terminate on August 31st, 2120. So it will last through most of the summer, um, but there, there may be a gap, and I just wanted to put you on notice of that. Council Member Nash. Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to direct this question to you, Mayor Taylor, if you um, don't mind. And my feeling was um, on this that the pools are actually open now as opposed to the gyms, which are 
um, and are outdoors as opposed to the gyms, which are indoors and not allowed at this point. Um, so that is why I'm, that's what I'm basing these decisions on. And also um, on the fact that the pool is um, obviously arrested in a hot summer. And so I just wanted your views on that. Thank you. As far as the, the pool being open and not the community center. So with the with the pool, I I don't have an issue with the pool being opened. Um, I just look at the numbers. The reason it is underutilized is because of the hours of operation, and then also the outreach. Uh, this was a discussion um, that we had with the pool operator, um, and some has some of that has changed um, a little bit, um, but it's still underutilized because of the hours of operation. There's not an equal, the same hours for the Burgess pool and the same hours for the Bellhaven pool. It's different. Um, the number of hours open is different. Councilmember Mueller. You guys are the best. We're doing great. But it's obvious it's going to be a longer night than normal. And I'm really hungry. <laughs> so can we just have uh, like a 10 minute break so I can go get some food? <laughs> yes, please. Councilmember Carlton, mind? you're on mute. Okay. Sorry. Do you mind if we keep going for like another 15 minutes or so and and uh, take a take a break then? Can we split the difference and say another seven minutes? Okay. Thank you. When Councilmember Mueller brought up, uh, well, in my mind, I believe he brought up dinner. So I. I uh, don't remember where we left off. <laughs> the I think reason we were, I think, I think, I think, I think the pool, I think the pool staying on based on everything I've heard. I think the pool staying on, I think that's unanimous. Everyone wants the pool. Stay, I mean, stay off, get off the list. Pool's off the list. I, I vote. Okay. I make a motion that the pool stays. On the list? So oh, no. We remove. Yeah, we keep it. If we remove oh, yeah. it from so it's off the list then it's yeah. off the current list okay yeah okay I so the motion on the floor uh by council member carlton is to remove 179 from the cut list hmm. and if that is correct may i have a second i'll second vice mayor combs by roll call vote council member carlton aye council member mueller Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Combs? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. And uh, if you would like, we can move on to, um, I believe we've deferred childcare, which is one number 180 and 181. So we can move to 182, or at this time we could take a break, uh, dependent on city council. I believe take a break because gymnastics is going to last longer than a five minute discussion. Um, that's fine. Um, so go ahead and turn your microphones off and your cameras. Uh, when you do return, just can keep your microphones off and just pop your cameras on, please. Thank you. How long a break is this? When do you want us back? I don't think we decided on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's 737 currently. So let's say eight o'clock. Okay. Give Thank us you. enough time to chew. Thank you.
Welcome back. Uh, Ms. Heron, Councilmember Carlton needed to step into the PCE meeting, so she okay. will be back sometime after nine. Okay, thank you uh, for letting me know. So with a quorum, we may uh, continue the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Heron. And Mr. Jacobson, can you put the slides back up, please? Okay, and we were on item 182, gymnastics program. Correct, uh, deferring the child care items number 180 and 181 for further discussion later. So yes, 182 is our next item for discussion. I say we can I make a motion that we wait to go over the item with Council Member Carlton. It's one of the bigger ticket items on here. And candidly, if you guys want to wait until nine o'clock when she comes back, it seems odd we're doing budget without all five of us present. I agree. Um, and she did say at the beginning of the, the the time that we all came together that she had a seven o'clock PCE meeting. All right. Well, I'm happy to come back at nine o'clock when she's done with the PCE meeting. So, or whenever she's done, like we can just be texted when she's done, jump back on. But I don't think we should be making cuts without all five of us. I agree. Vice Mayor Combs, are you in, in agreement? Yeah. Do you want to come back at nine o'clock? <laughs> Nine is fine. Sounds like we're going to have another seven hour meeting uh, since we did start at four and it's already eight. Yeah, I mean, why don't we just let her know that we're, we're, we're wait like just when she's ready to text us all and we'll start up again. Text Judy Miss and Judy, Judy can text us all. <laughs> so is it direction of the council to um, uh, put a, a break in this meeting until City Council Member Carlton is ready to rejoin. Yeah, she, yes. she, she said she's going to text. I just got a text from her. She said she'll text us when she's done. So we're good to go. Okay, so I'll let her know to connect with me when uh, she is completed with her PCE and then I will reach out to the members of the council as well as city staff to reconvene. Um, okay. Due to just technology, we are going to keep this meeting as a live meeting. Um, that way uh, people can join in with the same uh, login code. So uh, again, just remember to mute and disable webcams until you receive a message from me to come back. All right, okay. okay. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Thank you.
Ms. Herring? I'm, I'm trying to text her to let her know that we're all back. Good evening, City Council members. Uh, I know we still are waiting for Kat to wrap up, but I do believe she will be uh, finishing in just a moment. So if you wanted to reconvene, you could and just begin discussions on the next item. Mayor Taylor, um, it's on you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome back. And Mr. Jacobson, if you could put the slide on the screen and I just wanted to do a check-in uh, Mr. Jacobson as far as um, where are we um, with numbers? Good evening again Madam Mayor, give me just a second I'll pull that up. So currently the running total of net impact on the deficit is 10.23 million. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Okay, and we are on item number 182, which is the gymnastics program reactivation for January 1st, 2021. And I don't remember, I don't remember how many of us uh, agreed to have us have it discussed and who wants to kick off the conversation about uh, the gymnastics program. Vice Mayor Cohn. Yeah, so I think my question to staff would be what direction specifically they're looking at, because I, I thought that like during the last meeting, we sort of arrived at a consensus, uh, especially in connection with the idea of the, the gymnastics program obviously not being up and running at the moment and, um, you, you know, sort of no clear timeline for when it would be. And when that does happen, like sort of what new sort of regulation might be in place and, and how that might impact their ability to um, um, to attract students or even the, the willingness to of, of people to participate at the same levels in the gymnastics program. So, uh, and again, please keep me honest, uh, the members of the council can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I thought that there was generally a consensus to, to like sort of furlough this, this program. Um, but so, so if, if that was the case, I, it was, it was interesting in kind of what, what specific direction the, the staff is looking for here. So I would agree that was originally the direction of the council, but then towards the end of the meeting, the council indicated that they wanted uh, the uh, gymnastics program brought back for discussion at tonight's meeting. But, and I don't think there was an official vote on it. So it was on the to discuss that list. I'm a, just candidly. Um, my recollection of that discussion was that Councilmember Carlton really had feelings about this ish topic. And uh, so I know it's, you know, 10 past nine, but I'd like to wait for her to make a decision on it. Jack, can you hear us?
I don't think she's logged back into the meeting as of yet. So then do, would we want to move on to another agenda item where we think her absence isn't as much an issue or do we just want to wait until until she can reappear to, to restart these these discussions? Councilmember Nash. You're on mute, Councilmember Nash. You are still on mute. Councilmember Nash, you may need to input your audio pin. I should have just sent it to you. That's on her way back right now. City Council Member Nash, are you able to hear us? Hello, now can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, amazing. Um, so I have a question for if we're trying to just uh, wait for Kat, I have a question for Derek, um, but I can also ask it in a, at another time. Um, should we decide to go on to another item or just wait for Kat? Well, we're going to wait for Kat for the gymnastics okay. item, but if you have a question for Mr. Swagger. I do. Um, so my question is, on page 86 of the approved budget, I understand this. it says, um, oh, there's Kat. Maybe we should, I'll, I'll hold. ...was to take a stance for the environment in the political arena. Can tell you for sure that the city Council, of welcome yeah, back, Councilmember Carlton. I think we can hear you're not muted. We can hear the PCE meeting. Okay, well, then we can begin the discussion about the gymnastics program reactivation. Councilmember Carlton, we waited for you. You're on mute. There we go. Um, I My position hasn't really changed since last time. I think um, it's going to be difficult to follow all of the uh, recommendations and have it fully up and, and running the way it was. Uh, I think it might be a good time to look at, uh, while we can provide some classes, uh, it's a good time to maybe look at a third party running it. I know that a, a few people who've been involved with gymnastics are interested in that. Um, I'm interested in hearing my colleagues' uh, opinion on this, but uh, I, I think we have a really solid, really fantastic program and I don't wanna lose that. But I, I think we also have to think realistically on how to safely uh, bring that back.
Council Member Mueller. Uh, support furloughing it for six months. At the six month timeline, we can bring it back to this. We can take it back to council and decide what we're going to do with it. Councilmember Nash. No. I think while we're waiting for Councilmember Nash, I'll just quickly say I'm I'm supportive of uh, Councilmember Mueller's uh, approach of, of furloughing it uh, for six months, and then um, at that date, sort of making an assessment of of whether you know this is something that um, the city should continue offering, given the larger environment, if it if it's possible, um, and if it is possible then whether it should continue on offering it and our, our sort of uh, look for third parties to, to operate it. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. Council Member Carlton. Uh, just being careful with words. We have a multi-million dollar gymnastics facility. It will be offered. It's just how it will be offered and by whom. Yeah, and it, that's why I use the word furlough. So it's, we're furloughing it and then we're trying to figure out in six months whether or not we continue with the furlough or whether or not there's, for budget reasons, we need to look at other options in terms of how those services are offered. But I don't believe that in the next six months we'll be offering these services to people. And I don't think uh, in this circumstance, I don't think, uh, I think that the budget that's, that's here can be used to employ other people to deliver services. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, just a really quick question for 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 staff, um, and maybe this is something that has been uh, answered before. When when we sort of have the expenditures or costs for the gymnastics program, right? It, is that essentially just sort of like equipment and salaries? Or does the city sort of like charge the program a a rent any sort of rental fee because for the the as as Councilmember Carlton pointed out for the facilities um, like does that happen at all whether it's with MCC or any of the you know these separate sort of revenue generating cost centers do we actually sort of like charge them for like their water usage for or rent or for electricity or when we look at these programs and their costs is it are we just looking at essentially kind of like a labor cost issue vice mayor combs thank you for your question um so i you know first of all re regarding contracting out um you i would just remind the council that even private businesses and all the gymnastics center up and down the peninsula right now are hurting uh, so the prospect of, of being able to do that fairly quickly, um, it, you know, uh, the prospects are, are, are low, uh, especially doing it in the meantime. Um, and so I think part of it will be how do we bridge the time, um, the closure of a facility, a vacant facility between now and the time we are actually able to be fully up and running. And, and I know the memo that I provided you in the previous uh, uh, council report um, actually outlined potential reactivation scenarios of which one of which you have listed here on number 182. So um, when we get to the point of issuing an RFP, we can write the RFP in any way um, that would suit the council um, that would make sense um, if you have a private operator, um, like whether it's childcare or if it's gymnastics or, or something, um, sometimes, um, 
you offer, um, sometimes it's done on a lease where they're responsible for most everything. Um, there are other times when you can charge a rent for simply being in the facility. Currently right now, like our contractors that we have, we usually have an arrangement where there's a percentage split. So, you know, they collect the revenues and so forth, or we may collect the revenues and then we essentially pay them for delivering the services and then the city takes a, a cut of that. Uh, and that really helps us to offset our cost of the facility and, and other things. So, so it, it really, we have options when, when or if we can get to that point. Councilmember Mueller. Yeah. And that's, and that's, I appreciate that, Derek. Yeah, that's right on. So I think, and I agree that it, I think the reason why I've said six months is because at six months we can look and see, one, do we see if the facility is going to be used again for another six months, or are we in the middle of a deeper pandemic and a second wave that's come from the fall? Two, will there be even private providers then? Because we don't want to, uh, and then three, uh, you know, so do we want to, is it, you know, well, I guess it's only two. <laughs> well, other than three, do we want the city to, or three, do we want the city to continue doing it as a service anyway, right? Regardless of, of those other considerations. So, I bet I think six months is appropriate. I don't think it comes back for six months and it's a lot of money to carry it for six months. I think it's a good thing to furlough it. Council Member Nash. Okay, Betsy, I know you're gonna say, Ray, that was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, if I may, while while Councilmember Nash is um uh, dialing in, connecting. Yes, Mr. Pagaros. Um, uh, there we go. Uh good evening oh. again, Nick Pagaros, Assistant City Manager. I just wanted to answer Council, uh, Vice Mayor Combs' question about the sort of depreciable costs or capital replacement costs and whether or not those are charged through to our various fee-for-service programs. Um, <clears throat> the answer to that is, is it's a much bro it's a broader policy question that uh, if the council would like for us to return with that uh, policy, we can definitely uh, do that. It, um, in many cases, may make some of the programs cost prohibitive, uh, which is one reason why I suspect it hasn't been applied in the past. There are perhaps very small pieces, but when it comes to a capital replacement for whether it be our pool or gymnastic center, city hall, libraries, we currently do not have a policy of funding their eventual replacement. And um, the closest that we get to it is what Councilmember Nash had referenced earlier with regard to the pool that we have basically a piggy bank of about four hundred thousand dollars a year that we put, that we set aside to make any uh, significant uh, uh, replacements that may be required. So if the council directs, we can bring a capital replacement policy to, for the council's consideration. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that answer, uh, Mr. Pigueros. And I'm not asking for it, but I, I, I was sort of asking that question to point out that with all of these programs, there's an underlying subsidy um, that is happening here. So even if, like in theory, like the gymnastics program looks like it sort of, you know, generates a a profit, even though nominal, or even looks like it breaks even, in reality, it's not breaking even, right? Because it's it's really not sort of bearing all of the costs it would. Um, uh, if, if, it, if it were sort of offered by, by the private sector, um, whether it's rent, whether it's, it's those other things. So, so I just think it's, again, like as we go through these, these, it's worth noting that, again, there is an underlying subsidy, which is a policy decision, which is completely fine. Um, but, but I do think it, it helps to, to, to make what we're looking at uh, a, lot, a lot more clear. Yes, it does. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. Council Member Carlton. Sure. I don't know if we have a motion and a second, but I just want to say that as we as we vote and do this, I've had both of my children go through the gymnastics program. I have nothing but respect for those teachers. Uh, a couple of them, I, we've become friends through the years, and I don't want this in any way to be interpreted as a slight in any way, shape, or form. 
I have a lot of respect and I think that we have, we are so blessed to have the dedicated, amazing people that we do in the gymnastics program. Thank you, Council Member Carlton. Council Member Nash, did you still have a question or comment? Um, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, now I'm back to my computer, which wasn't working earlier today, or the, the anyway. Um, so what I would, I'm not, I don't wanna belabor it right now, but um, when I was going through the budget in preparation for all these meetings, on um, it, there is something called a general fund subsidy per part participant hour. And I would like to discuss that at some point and just, and yes, maybe develop a policy around subsidies and um, the greater idea of, um, well, and how all of these different pieces fit together, um, both in times of um, lean economics and also when the city is doing very well. Um, but I think we should, I would like to um, discuss it and actually make conscious decisions about what we would like the policies to be, not right now. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Nash. Um, I am definitely a supporter of furloughing this for six months. And I'm not sure if Councilmember Carlton, if there was a motion. So maybe I imagined it. Uh, Councilmember Nash. Sorry, um, one other question, which I don't know if it was um, answered when I was offline, but is there is there a difference um, between furloughing for six months and how does that affect the budget? Is it still just stay on the list and it's just a note to us? Yes, uh, Council uh, Member Nash, thank you for the question. The um, We're gonna have to do a little bit of um, that, that's a detail that we're going to have to figure out quite honestly. Um, the um, furlough of the program uh, will be reflected in the budget as a program that is either expected to return in January or uh, is a placeholder, and in which case we would fund the second half of the year of the program, or it will be a placeholder that, with a discussion that talks about the need to revisit the ability to provide the service and return it uh, into to activation in January of 2021. Um, how that reflects and how that hits the actual annual budget deficit is, is a nuance that I need to uh, work through with the city manager um, or if the council has direction tonight, that perhaps could be very helpful. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, so again, not an accountant at all, but given that like this sort of um, reactivation of the program doesn't happen by default, but happens by what only happen as a result of sort of proactive council action, it would seem as though to me like you know none of the cost would would appear because um, um, that that latter half of the 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 year cost is 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 a council action that hasn't taken place unless it was sort of we were default saying that like you know the program is going to automatically reactivate but again so that's how I think I would look at it but but not a, a again. No, I am not a, an accountant, and so I, I don't know how those things are usually done. Uh, through to Mayor, if I may. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor Combs, the, the how you described it is is the preferred approach. Um, I the constructing a deficit. A significant deficit era budget that we're that we're constructing right now, and we'll be constructing for the council's consideration, um, ha is a bit different than what we historically do. But uh, definitely having a conversation, and at least the city manager's transmittal letter about the council's uh, actions or, or preferences for for furloughed programs to return uh, for council consideration. I think that's probably the best place to put it and we omit it from the um, expenditure uh, projections for next fiscal year. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, it occurs to me that it's neither. Uh, so it occurs to me that the line item of the budget is if there's no one signed up for it, it's inactive. But if there are people signed up for it, 
uh, come December, then it would not appear as $815,680. It would be full cost recovery, in which case it would cancel out on the budget. So uh, I don't believe in the second half of the, so if it's the intention of the council to only bring it back, which I believe it is, once that it's actually being used again, then I don't, then I think it's, I don't think it's in the budget. And I, th I, I don't think it's in the budget, but I don't think it's not in the budget because we'd have to spend the 815680 the second half of the year. It's not in the budget because we're bringing it back once it's full cost recovery again, or whatever it is, I, whatever it was before that, but I'm pretty sure it was a full cost recovery program. Thank you, Council Member Mueller. And Ms. Heron, you were you appeared on the screen. Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Uh, there was brief uh, talk about stating a motion, but uh, then there was more council uh, consideration and questions. So uh, when you are ready to greet that motion, I'll come back. Thank you. So I thought, I thought Ray, Ray had made a motion. Was that just a suggestion? If you make the motion, I'll second it. I don't care either way. It's fine. So, uh, City Councilmember Mueller, do you mind restating the motion for the record? It was uh, furlough for six months. Councilmember Nash, is this a second or a question? A question. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, what does it? Um, what is the budget implication of saying that we are voting on a furlough for six months? It means that we're not dedicating 815,680. So this is how I would say it. I'm sorry, does it essentially does it essentially stay on the list or come off the you know what it, it's staying it's it's on the list as a cut for eight hundred and fifteen thousand six eighty, which would be the amount that we would have to carry it from today to January to January first. And that's with the assumption that during that time period, people aren't using it. The second, now, the reason why I don't think we need to budget the second portion after January 1st is because the assumption is if we're bringing it back, people are using it again, and it's full cost recovery. And if they're not, then we'll have to go ahead and make a budget allocation for it at that time. So assumably we would pull that from, assumably we would pull that from reserves because it wouldn't be in line with what the, what the, the policy that we move forward tonight with it. And that's that for this program, we can't take budget for this program to pay employees not to provide a service while we're laying other employees off who do. I'm sorry, it's must be getting late. I'm trying to figure out. So is this any different than the other programs that we are talking about? Basically, um, are we, I do. I personally do not. I am. I am concerned that the program, when it comes back, will not be self-sustaining. In which case, we will have a decision to make whether we want how much we want to subsidize it. Right. And, and we're not putting any money into the budget right now to subsidize it the second half of the year. Okay. So we are. A, okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'm. Um, so my motion is that we furlough this program for six months. And that doesn't mean we're eliminating the program. That's not what it means. It means at the six month time period, we're gonna figure out what the status of the program is and what the appropriate way to move forward is. Council Member Carlton. Do we have the staff since we're cutting everyone to do an analysis on uh, bringing in I, I, I'm saying it if no, if it's not happening, maybe that's a good time for us to look at uh, outsourcing and uh or having it be a, a management run management owned however you want to phrase it uh for the gymnastics do we have the staff to to work with the gymnastics people to see if that's an option or to do an rfp kind of a thing i i'd like to i'd like to have us know what we're doing and plan and be able to make informed, intelligent decisions okay. when it comes back. 
can we can we take that up a different night after the budget cat because i think that's a longer discussion okay i just want to make sure it doesn't get lost that's fine i appreciate it and i don't i don't know how the rest of you feel that would be that was just my suggestion that's fine it's getting late we got to get a we have a list to get through so thank you through the mayor um we have a motion on the floor from council member mueller to uh, furlough the program for six months and leaving it on the list as a current cut. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. And by roll call vote, Council Member Carlton? Aye. Council Member Mueller? Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Combs? Yes. And Mayor Taylor? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Uh, Dan, if you could move the screen down to the next line item. Okay, so we are looking at number 183. Thank you, Ms. Heron. So 183 is freeze inspection services vacant position. Can I ask the community development? Madam Mayor, can I ask where we are in terms of the current uh, budget or in terms of deficit left? The last count, I believe, from Mr. Jacobson was uh, 10 million 230,000. Is that correct, Mr. Jacobson? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, that sounds correct. Uh, with this change, it brings us up to 10.99 million. Good, which was about 1.5 million left to be made up. Um, so, uh, Council Member Mueller, there's a, a little bit of a distinction there given that uh, the Council has not yet discussed changes to the child care programs, but we estimate the total need to be 13.5 million. 13. Okay. So it's. 2.5 left. Yes, that's correct. Okay. I'm just going to come out of the box and say I don't want to freeze inspection or service, the inspection services for the vacant position. Like, all right. You got three votes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why we ended up pulling it to discuss it because it, I don't think anybody wanted to cut it. Well, Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, my question here is that so this is a a, a not filled position, correct? Um, isn't there a general hiring freeze in place? Like, so how does and is that not the direction we've given to the city manager? So how does like filling a currently vacant position fit within our overall general direction of having a hiring freeze? Because we need it. Like it's this is super I mean, hard. We just need this position. Um, um how how is this this function currently being serviced is it is it not a function and this is to staff or or <laughs> um I saw Deanna went away um uh, uh like it, give me so is this a service not being formed by not being provided currently by the city or, or is it being provided crappily um or, or with a, a really like sort of bad sla um Give me some sense of the status quo. You're on mute, Ms. Chow. Great. Thank you, sir, for the delay there. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Taylor, members of the City Council, Deanna Chow, Interim Community Development Director. So with respect to inspection services, so this is a currently vacant position. Um, we've had some challenges in filling our inspections, and so what we've done is supplemented with contract inspectors. So we currently have four FTE filled, um, and we have supplemented with um, contract inspectors. So our, our service right now, I think, is um, we're meeting our, our targets. There, um, we're reactivated our inspection services. Um, was talking to our building official earlier today, and in terms of, I, I think we're um, we don't. We're, we're currently meeting our, our timelines and you know people are calling getting inspections 
and we're able to fill that um, as we speak. And, and okay, I think with um, yeah. no, no, please continue. No, I, I was just saying, and I, and I think you know, with uh, the projects that we have in place, we are currently wrapping up some two of our large projects. Um, that would be Menlo Gateway Phase Two, and looking to complete uh, the tenant improvements of the Facebook uh, Building Twenty Two in the coming months. Um, we, we think that this could be a potential to save resources by um, freezing the inspector position, but certainly we have a number of projects in the development queue and um, would like to um, reserve that opportunity to hire um, if development inspection times um, do decrease and, and need to fill that position. Cool. Th thanks for that answer. So again, I, I mean, we can proceed to like a vote on this. I'm comfortable with it staying to be cut. Um, I, I don't see any reason why, why we would preserve this vacant position. Um, given the larger scenario and given that it seems as though the services is being provided um, um, at, at the moment uh, without too too much of a, a, a complication or interruption. Thank you, Vice Mayor Combs. Council Member Nash. So given that we're currently using contractors, would it be beneficial to would it be less expensive if we took a person on or is it um, perfectly and more efficient or is it perfectly satisfactory? And then my question is, should we try to be hiring someone or it, are we fully loaded? We're doing fine the way we are. So I, I'd like to remind uh, the council that as part of the um, cut budget, uh, there was um, reductions in contract services for inspections, plan checking, as well as admin for building permit. Um, so there are um, some benefits in being able to have the contract inspectors. They do fulfill a need when we um, are able, when we do have a pickup in inspections. And so we do have that flexibility to um, supplement and hire. Oftentimes um, they may come with some expertise or technical expertise that they may be able to be dedicated to a particular large project. And so that has been beneficial. Um, and that comes with the waves of our um, development projects. Certainly our building inspections team is very capable and um, able to um, manage and move around. It just provides less flexibility to um, increase. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we've had some challenges in filling our um, inspector positions. Um, development has been high in, uh, you know, in the region. And so finding qualified inspectors um, has been, and has been uh, a challenge. I have a, a question, uh, Ms. Chow, and just thinking about the four FTEs that are temporary um, versus the cost of one FTE that's vacant. Uh, what what does it cost for the city to have the four temporary FTEs? So where the the four full time FTEs for inspectors? You, you stated earlier that the city is fulfilling the current need. Um, uh, when you we currently have four full-time uh, equivalent building inspectors, and we have supplemented with contract inspectors. And so, what's I will the say cost? Contract inspectors are quite contract inspectors are quite costly. We pay them on an hourly rate. Um, I'd have to pull up to see what the, the um, cost difference is depending upon the positions, but what we've been filling at have been. Uh, a higher, I would say, a higher level building inspector, probably equivalent to a senior building inspector, the ones that have been uh, provided through contract services. Councilmember Nash. Thank you. Um, so you said that we've already, um, or we have already cut some of the contract services. Can you handle this position as a contractor given the current cuts or do you need some adjustment in order to be able to fulfill this function? So we do have um, the ability to, to flex and, and with some existing contract services to hire if needed. I believe Mr. Murphy at the last meeting explained that if we, um, do you see that increase in need that we would come back to the city council? So I think we feel comfortable moving forward with staffing. Certainly, 
um, as I mentioned, it doesn't provide great flexibility. Um, and if something does happen to our existing staff, that would put us in a bind. Um, but with our existing resources, I think we can make some adjustments um, and address our current development needs. And um, if the council will let us come back with uh, additional budget amendments if needed, if we do see um, either a, a, a reduced, um, an increased queue for inspections um, and, and a demand for um, uh, development and inspections, um, we'd like that flexibility to, to return. But I think what we propose, we feel comfortable um, given our, our current project load. Councilmember Nash. Thank you. So um, thank you, Vice Mayor Combs, for pursuing this line of thought. And I have now flipped so that I would leave it on the list. Fine, we can leave it. I'm fine with leaving it on the list. Fine. The staff doesn't sound like they need it, so it's okay. Well, looking at the, the list and just it's a it's about a million dollars. So, uh, Ms. Chow, if you could come back. So, in lieu of leaving every item on here on the list, um, what do you believe you need? If there, you you had a choice of one item on here to be able to uh, fulfill planning needs for the city. Yes. So, I'd like to remind um, the council. I believe Mr. Jacobson also reminded that one item is not shown on this, and so I believe it was item 49 in the previous chart. It was the long-range planning services. So, I, I, I think it's all of the planning. I'm sorry. Isn't that? Oh, this says reduce long-range planning projects. Is that the item you're talking about? We have something um, on our list. Okay. I know in the, in the staff report on um, uh, yeah, on page two. So. Uh, no. So um, I sort of see these all interrelated when we talk about planning and, and building services. Certainly once you have increased development, you're gonna, then gonna need plan checking um, from building division and then inspection services. So they're somewhat all intertwined. And um, uh, you know, I, 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 while I said, you know, I think we have the ability to, to work with um, the staff that we have now, certainly um, it is, uh, I, I don't know if it's necessarily sustainable in the long term if you know the number of projects that we have on file um, we do have 10 EIRs right now um, ongoing for the large development projects in the Bayfront area and so that has definitely put pressure on staff um, so keeping um, our, our planners planners um, is something where I, I would encourage so that we can augment and um, potentially relieve some of the load of our existing current planners again I think we can manage, but it's not um, sustainable if more um, projects uh, of um, such <laughs> complexity come in, or even if some of the smaller projects come in, it makes it more challenging to um, provide greater flexibility amongst our, our teams. And certainly if we look to um, pursue our long range planning efforts, um, I know in the past we've talked about potential changes to the specific plan, potential changes to um, our general plan. The housing element is certainly um, a a mandated item that is coming up um, for the city. And, and you know, I, I do believe it's gonna take um, consultant resources, staffing resources, you know, our community involvement. Um, and so that would um, be deferred if um, we reduce the $600,000 long range planning project um, coming to you next week um, or next council meeting on the, in the June uh, 9th, we are looking to bring you a, a grant um, application so that we could um, potentially start doing some of our housing element services if awarded the grant. So we are looking at other opportunities for funding, but um, but certainly um, we do see a need for long range planning services. So it's a matter of looking to um, deferring that or starting that now. And, and just as a reminder, the $600,000 is, is not the full budget for what it would take to do a housing amount element. It would uh, allow us to get started in this fiscal year. Uh, I appreciate that. And I have one follow-up question and then I'll um, defer to um, Councilmember Carlton. And it, it's my understanding that anything related to an EIR is, is covered by the applicant, not by the city. So if some of these are covered by the applicant, then it wouldn't be an expense to us. That is correct. And, and certainly for development projects, staff time is billable to the applicant and it is cost recovery. 
So, um, and, and EIRs also are something that um, the, con the contract is managed by the project planner, but is paid for by the applicant. Okay. So the, the city you. does not incur costs in the EIR. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Carlton. Hi, Deanna. Uh, thank you. Uh, I understand that we have an open spot that we're talking about. If, if we uh, pull these things or, or cut these things, are you going to have layoffs in, in that department? So the items that are before the council this evening are currently vacant positions. So the two planner positions and the um, building inspector positions are currently vacant. Okay. And I, and I don't mean to, to do one thing one day and do one on the other, but I have to ask. Um, We've discussed it ad nauseum that, that uh, it, because of CalPERS, it's preferable to use contract workers where we can because it leaves us with less uh, liability in the long term. Uh, is there a way to provide you with like a float budget or something where if things get uh, if you if if things get bad and you need a contract broker, I'm I'm concerned about things. When does the housing element start? Is that start this year or is that start January? So uh, we are starting to have conversations now as part of our 21 elements, um, which is a countywide effort that we participated in the last two cycles. Or, and so um, we're starting to have conversations now. Um, our numbers have not come out yet. We expect them to come out um, later this year, but um, it, it's part of uh, doing background research right now um, and, and doing some data collection that we could start working on, but it's not due until uh, the end of 2022, so December of 2022. Okay, so it's not critical we do it right now, but um, but doing the housing element is mandatory, as we learned. And uh, I, I heard rumor that the ABAC numbers were going to be rough, but we'll we'll see how that comes out. I just want to make sure that you're covered on that and some of the other things. Um, I I do tend to prefer using contract workers where we can. Uh, simply because of the CalPERS and the other issue and the flexibility that provides. Uh, I, I feel better that we're not laying off people. Um, and uh, I appreciate what you're saying about keeping that one item. So um, if, if you're good with it, I'm good with it. I, I'm, I, I guess we're looking to you and your expert level. We don't, we don't want to cause more problems for the city by trying, you know, you, they say save a penny, spend a pound. You know, we want to make sure that we're doing the cuts, uh, really taking in consideration your your informed opinion. So uh, mm -hmm. we appreciate you coming and talking to us about, about the needs. And uh, do you feel in this climate, if there is an unexpected run for everyone wanting to remodel their house or whatever, uh, that you would be able to uh, come back to us or you would be able to find the contract people? Because I know in the past we've had trouble finding the contract workers to hire in the first place. Yeah, yes, thank you, Councilmember Carlton. So we've had challenges um, hiring both contract staff and um, FTE positions. That's why I think some of our positions are, are vacant. Um, we've had turnover, you know, it's been, uh, development has been, um, at a high and planners are in demand and have the options to move around and so we've lost planners um, over the years and so it's been challenged to um, hire and certainly train and then even in the contract um, profession um, they're in high demand as jurisdictions try to supplement and so we've been in competition with trying to um, find contract staff as well so from both angles it has been challenging I will say there is a benefit of having staff, um, you know, just with the familiarity of uh, sure. the city and familiarity of the issues, um, knowing the knowledge of the the codes um, and um, and you know the the planning commission and the public city council, you know, there is a benefit to that, um, you know, versus uh, oftentimes sharing a contract planner who may not be physically in the office and you know sharing uh, codes and you know it's. It, it, it's not as uh, consistent, but you know we do rely on it, and they have provided um, great services too. So um, we're thankful for that. Yeah, if, if only we could have a, a half dozen Thomas Rogers. Um, I uh, 
I mean, my, my gut feeling is we could probably leave it open and we'd be lucky to fill the position in, in January, even if we didn't cut it. So uh, I, I look to you to tell us what you're comfortable with. I, I mean, I think I, I, I mean, coming from where I, you know, you know, saving, these were tier three items, you know, and so I had, uh, I, I had trouble trying to say that these would not have impact to, you know, city um, services, you know, and sort of putting together um, this, this budget, you know, I think, um, you know, with all of our departments, you know, cutting staff or reducing our staffing levels means um, not only impacting people, but also our service to the services to the city. And as you know, some of our, many of our services are mandated, right? We were talking previously about um, timelines that we need to hit our SB 330 projects. And, um, and so it, it affects our planners, our building plan checkers, you know, our inspectors who um, are out there in the field as well. Um, and so all, all of the positions I think are critical, as I mentioned, they are all interrelated because, you know, once we get through a development project, it kicks on into the building department and then they are affected. It just makes go in cycles because, you know, you have to have the entitlement first before it gets through to the next phase. So I have I have one one follow up question and then and then I'll stop. Um, I, I support your keeping the long range planning projects staff. Uh, if and when they have the flexibility, are they available to help with other programs too, or will they be solely dedicated to those long range projects? I, I think there could be flexibility. Certainly, once we start doing our housing element, um, I could see that being. Uh, somewhat of a full-time position, um, but there certainly is um, flexibility in our in all of our staff, and we pull in others to, you know, help with our zoning changes or, you know, green sustainable building regulations like EV chargers. So we do um, have pulled staff resources and, you know, try to provide experiences in, in long-range planning, but given the number of projects that we have now, that becomes very limited uh, in our ability to do that. All right. So, um, I mean, I was I was 100% behind giving you the staff that you need and, and not cutting this. Um, I I will keep an open mind on on what we need to do. And and I saw that Councilmember Mueller had his hand up, so I'll I'll let him. Councilmember Mueller, we can't hear you. I'm just very confused because. If there's one thing that I don't think has really changed in the city, it's the people who, uh, it's our development projects and our need to, uh, our need to do a housing element and everything that was pending in the city. And so I, again, I think you're really, I think you're a wonderful person. I think you're trying to save jobs right now is what I, is candidly, like I'll just be candid with you. I think you're trying to save other people's jobs right now with these vacant positions, but I, I'm concerned that you're putting that the end result of that may be that you won't have enough capacity once things start moving again. And uh, I think that in the pandemic, the things that they're going to make sure move first and what we've seen is development because it's such an indicator for the rest of the economy. So if they're going to be lax anywhere on what projects they're allowed to go first. It's going to be that. And I think we've already seen uh, we've already seen that start to happen. I think it's going to continue to happen, and I think that the reason why that happens is because it is uh, a leading indicator of economic growth for the rest of a city. And so, um, I, I, uh, I'm very like, I just remember, and I guess part of my concern comes from the fact that when I was mayor, and we had, you know, talk of, you know, we were we were looking at. The, uh, possible moratorium and the general plan and the housing element and everything all at once and I'd go back to staff and say guys like we need to move this forward and their response is we can only do so much and uh, what's going to happen I know next year is like the housing element that timeline is not going to change I know my colleagues still care about looking at the general plan that's not going to change and I know Willow Village is coming and that's not going to change. And I know all those people with SB 330 uh, rights, that's not going to change. So I'm really concerned, like, I want to get the savings and I want to save jobs, but I do not want to hamstring this, your department. Because if there's one department I know is going to be working in short order, 
fits this department. So um, I'm 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 fine with 183. I'm really I'm really uh, skeptical on the on the rest just because we haven't filled them. I mean, we weren't able to fill them because the market was so high. <laughs> it wasn't that we couldn't fill them because we didn't need them. It's because it was because the market was so hot we couldn't get them. Yeah, I I agree in that. And thank you, you know, for the support. Um, yes, I mean that's why it's a recommended you know recommendation of a tier three. You know, this would have um, impacts, but you know, again. I think it's been mentioned we're, you know, um, we're looking to see where we could cut costs, you know, and these are potentials, not ideal, but, you know, potential options for alternatives for the council to consider. Yeah, I think, I personally think we need them because I think that, I think, I think these are things that we can't, I think there's way too much going on in terms of city planning right now for us to cut in these areas. And I also think that, that when things move in this area, it will cause other revenues to come back faster. So if like in constructing a budget, this would not be the area I'd be looking to cut. It's a, this has a multiplier effect. Council member Carlton. I, I have to say I agree. And, and what I was trying to get at before, I think I'm getting tongue tied here is when I was talking about a fund is my, my fear is we leave them on and we're still not able to hire the people. As some of these, some of these positions have been open for months. And and probably will still be. Um, I mean, when do you think you you would even fill these? By by, do you think you'd you'd actually hire all these positions by December? By December to hire three two planners plus a a con uh, an inspector. Um, we could probably put out notices. I don't know if we would be successful, but. Um, you know, See, we need to work with our, our our HR department, but I mean, I, yeah, I'm great if we can start to look at, you know, augmenting our, our staff. Um, it would it would provide, uh, I think, some it would provide relief. Um, but you know, again, uh, trying to trying to um, and it would allow us to move forward if we are looking to do some long range planning efforts, um, and we can certainly come back and have a. a a bigger discussion around what uh, what is needed for our housing element. Councilmember Nash. So I agree with everything that's been said. I'm very concerned about um, the long range planning projects and the ability to meet the SB 330 timelines and do an effective job of the reviews. We've got a limit of, I believe it's five reviews in the city for these SB 330 projects. And so I would move that we um, leave 183 on the list and that we remove 184, 185 and the long range planning projects. Councilmember Nash, can you restate what you want, um, what you want kept on the cut list? Only 183. It's exactly the same as Councilmember Mueller just said. Thank you. Councilmember Carlton? Just to make sure I understand, you're also leaving the, the long range planning long range planning projects. Okay, so leaving long range planning projects and 183. Correct? No. No. Okay, I don't 180, so 183 um, stays on the list to be cut. Right. 184, 185, and long range planning come off of the list. I and agree. Are not, not to be uh, contrarian, but what do you guys think about, and I need to ask Deanna's opinion, if we just reduced the 600,000 to like 450 or 300 to can gain some savings in long-term planning. Is that possible and still be able to do? I mean, candidly, the, the concern here is, Indiana, we need you. I know my camera automatically turned off. My apologies. No worries. <laughs> what, uh, what, what, these issues that you touch on are such an issue in the city that people just care about it and you know be done with the level of, of uh, you know just it, it, there's so much 
uh, apprehension about these things being done right. My question is, if we were to reduce the 600 to 450 or to three or, or to 300, is that going to be really affecting your service level in these areas such that the work product would suffer? So, just as a reminder, the budget for to do, for the housing element will be greater than six hundred thousand dollars. Then leave it. Yeah, forget it. Just leave it. It's got to stay. I mean, just for magnitude, the general plan was about one point seven million. Yeah. Um, and, I don't and so think... this is this is the beginning. Of, yeah. Uh, our, our conversation. That's fine. I don't think we can do anything here. So. Deanna, the uh, Miss Chow, the grant that the city is applying for. Um, what's the total value of actually all the grants? Because I, I believe that there are a few available. Sure. So we were awarded, uh, the, the council authorized the application for SB2 funding. We have been awarded that. That's, I believe, $160,000 that will go towards um, work on doing some minor modifications to the specific plan. So um, things that might be able to tweak some of our development regulations but doesn't tweak the overall development cap or anything that would require um an environmental impact report so that would help fund that plus some additional um outreach and efforts towards our accessory dwelling unit um regulations so that would be covered by sb2 for and those are considered long-range planning efforts and then the leap grant which is a local early planning grant i believe um is the acronym is for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, um and we are suggesting that that be used towards um like sort of start at cost for um, the housing element. Thank and you. And that'll come before the council on the June 9th meeting. Was there any other follow up question? Uh, council yeah, member I'll, Mueller? I'm, I'm going to second Betsy's motion and call the question. Unless you want to make a comment. It's Can just I just one for the inspector position? So that would be a freeze. So if we do need to see that position filled because of the development, um, that could happen in a future um, fiscal year then. Yeah, you just would bring you would bring it to us on an agenda. Ms. Chow, so your your camera just automatically shuts off. I know, I know. I'm sorry. My apologies. That, no, that's okay. Okay, so we have a. I have a, I have a, a question on on just the the technicality of this. Are we getting rid of that position so that that FTE no longer exists, and then we would reinstate it, or are we just freezing that higher? It's a freeze, so we're freezing the position. The FTE is not disappearing. Okay. Vice Mayor Combs. Yeah, I'll just sort of chime in. I'm I'm not going to be able to to support this again. We're we're talking about sort of freezed, not filled positions to some extent. Um, and again, it's it's hard for me if if we're if there's a general sense of, of we're saying that there should be a hiring freeze. That, that we're sort of authorizing the unfreezing of, of positions. Uh, we're not. So it's, it's, that one's staying on. But the, there is your, the, let me, uh, 184, one, excuse me, 185 is, 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 is coming off, right? Yeah. And, and that's, um, and that's freeze one FTE senior planner and one FTE associate planner positions. Right, or, or, or those, those are, or those, but those are positions we haven't been able to fill that we've been trying to fill for a long time. Like yeah, there is and, need, there is need for them. Yeah, again, like it's it's hard for me to support. Like if we've said that there should be a hiring freeze, um, uh, because of the overall <laughs> budget situation, it's it's hard for me to then sort of, and we are as a result of that actually engaged in layoffs. Um, it, it's hard for me to come around for like a scenario where we then are sort of essentially actively recruiting for 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 positions. Can I um, can I make a rhetorical argument to try to convince you? <laughs> you can make whatever argument you want. Yeah. Well, not rhetorical. I'll just make an argument. So let's say that you're at a hospital and you have uh, 
you have one hospital, you need you have one doctor and you need three, all right? You need three to take care of all the patients you have, and uh, but you, and you only have one, and there's but and all of a sudden a pandemic hits and there's budget cuts, and you have to cut things in that hospital. You still need the three doctors for those patients. Do you freeze the three doctors? You know, and and you you need three doctors, right? And you need the lights on, and you need the PPE. You, you know, the, the whole thing is that with those scenarios, rarely is it is it as clean. You know, rarely is the 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 parable actually plays out in real life. I mean, like I said at the beginning, I think there was lots of like heart decisions, and and I don't see like and again, this could all be moot because it's a likelihood for with regards to the open positions that. They're not even filled, and and you know, uh, uh, you know, that quickly. Or it could be that like this is the great a great time to be hiring because there there are lots of, of people on the market, and, and so that that could certainly be an argument for for having this recruiting pipeline open. Again, I, I would just suggest that it's upon us to go further to figure out the, whether or not it's that clean or not. That being just a, making it a philosophical decision. In some cases, requires going deeper to determine whether or not the need is such that it goes past the it goes past. That's all. In this case, I think the need does go past. I, I agreed with you when we went to the inspectors, but in this case, I know how bad we need the planners, and I know that mountain of work that's coming toward us. Yeah, and and I again, like for me as as I stand here, I, I think there's there's lots of sort of critical and important things that that we do in the city. Earlier, I, you know, again, I made a, a vote to 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 cut sworn officers, right? Um, and and so for me, this again fits within that that pattern of me looking at 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 a budget deficit of what now thirteen million dollars. Um, and 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 an, I, I think an unlikelihood that that we're going to see a return to you know 2019 you know uh, revenue levels for, for for some time, and so and so this this fiscal year may not be the first dip into um, you know in, into the reserves, and so that that's where I see it, and and it could be the case that 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 all of these sort of planning projects and, and that there's there's no sort of change in, in, in the, the schedule or timeline of the housing element um, and, and some of these other uh, other sort of projects. Um, but, um, but I think it's likely that, that some timelines will change, right? Um, because I think a lot of cities are in a lot dire situations than, than, than Menlo Park are. And so, so I think that there's going to be a requirement that, that some of these things, um, you, you know, that the timeline changes. Um, <laughs> I don't think you're changing the housing element. But I'll give up trying to convince you. <laughs> okay, totally true. Point, point of order, you called the question. You still call it? Yeah. I was just trying to see if I could get unanimous. Yeah, All right. It will not be unanimous uh, because oh, oh, wow, I'm just exactly. looking at it. It will not be unanimous. I mean, can, I'm looking at um, one, I'm, I've hit the wall. That's one part. Um, <laughs> so just looking at what's on the on the list to be cut. Um, what I would need to see is um, all of the grants that the city is going to be applying for, which means that this cha that would change the numbers. Um, I don't see anything around cost recovery because some of these we do not, we won't be paying for, it will be put on the expense of the, the applicant. And so um, this may not be our true cost. It may be less. We don't know. And so I would need to see that there. Um, and then also, I agree with Vice Mayor Combs as far as freezing um, a vacant position. So we're laying off people. We we just opened a pool that didn't hire any staff of Menlo Park, and then we closed a closed a community center that did. And so, well, I'll, are so we in the service. Just a minute. Are we are we in the service of planning? Are we in the service of community service? What 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 is the service for Menlo Park? And so for me, um, I look at community services just as important as I do with planning. And I know that there is a need for planning. Um, but if we have grants on the table that we're going to apply for, and that's coming up in less than a, a week or 10 days, that may change these numbers. So for me, that would need to be reflective in what we're looking at. And then also the cost recovery. This isn't what we're actually going to pay or this isn't going to be our cost if we have a developer submitting an application. 
Is, is am I correct, Michelle? We wouldn't be paying for that service. They would be paying us for the service. Well, it, it, it's sort of it's neutral, right? So the the EIR costs, the other technical studies costs, those are uh, paid for by the applicant. So those don't show up necessarily. Those aren't those aren't uh, costs necessarily to the city. And then we do have staff time that is spent, and it is cost recovery for, in general, for work on development projects. There are other items that are part of responsibilities and duties of planners that aren't necessarily um, development or billable related um, that are not uh, as cost, that are not cost, cost recovery. So, for example, work on a long range planning effort is not cost recovery. Unless but we are applying for grants for that. Uh, so far, we for the housing element, we do not have any grant funding towards that. Uh, we are but we are applying apply for, for one, grants for one that's uh, up to that's up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's correct. But again, the magnitude of the cost for a general uh, a housing element um, will be much greater than the six hundred thousand dollars that we have identified here for this fiscal year. Um, and and so I, I want to say in two thousand thirteen it was probably eight hundred thousand to a million, um, and the general plan itself was about one point seven. And that does not include staff costs. Right. But the city benefited off of updating the general plan because then yes, we got to certainly. it, correct? So there's a trade-off. And, and, and likewise with the housing element, um, you know, we'll be compliant and and correct. Councilmember Nash. Well, I was just gonna say to me, this is the core of our city, and we need to do everything we can to plan the best we can. And this will give us um, the ability to do that. I have long felt that our community development group is running way too lean and really needs um, additional people. Some of it is that they were not able to hire people in the previous market. Um, but I think that um, before the pandemic hit, we were talking about starting the housing element. We're now start, um, it is not too soon to be doing that now. And we've also been talking about revising the downtown specific plan. We've been talking about revising Connect Menlo. We have to get these projects going and it will be wonderful if we have grants and things to backfill, um, but I don't wanna wait around for those to be able to, get moving on these issues. Um, I think this is a area that um, really needs a little, um, we, there's nothing much to cut here is my problem. And I understand the argument that we have some openings and it's a good idea to freeze vacancies rather than cut, um, have to lay off people. But this is one area that's, we need, to, we haven't been running with enough people and we now have SB 330 plus, um, which means that everything will be much um, on a faster timeline. We need, we need staffing. Council Member Mueller. Yeah, so uh, as I look at this, it's kind of like half dozen one, half dozen the other, except uh, well, how well people are trained because all that work's gonna come no matter what, right? Like that wave is headed toward us and we'll either have capacity to deal with it or they'll come or our staff will come to us and say, mid-year and say, we need capacity, you guys to give us capacity to do this because we have legal obligations to do it. And by the way, uh, we may not work, you know, we'll see if we can hire them or we'll see if we can contract people. And the amount as, you know, in project management, you know that the amount of time you have to complete a project, first train of people, and then get the project done and do that project well is is finite. Or well, once people are playing catch up, they're playing catch up on an entire project. Um, so, but that being said, uh, I also respect the fact that a lot of this development that's coming in this wave is slated for district one. And if the district one, you know, council member doesn't support bringing capacity on for those services that at that time under the consideration that we want to make sure it's done right with that attention to detail, I think we'll end up budgeting for it later. I think we'll end up happening as mid-year, we'll end up budgeting it for it. So I'll support the mayor and the vice mayor and taking and taking it all off. I think we'll end up just having a budget for it later, but it'll, our budget will look cleaner now. So that's fine. 
Council Member Carlton. I don't. I don't. Uh, and I and I hope that Council Member Mueller doesn't actually change his mind on this because you know as well as I do that even leaving this on, this is why we always end up with the surplus in the budget, even though we have a balanced budget. We end up with a surplus because we can't actually hire people. We we put things out and we try hard and, and it still takes months to get around to doing this. This is actually something that critically, you know, with respect to, to Mayor Taylor, I understand what you're saying in terms of of what the city does and and how we balance that. And and I think the fact that we've been up till late at night, so many nights doing this is is an illustration of that. However, as as Councilmember Mueller pointed out before, uh, doing the planning, doing it right, and doing it timely actually does return the the largest amount of money that we get in this town is from uh, the tax from the land, and how that's done and how that's developed must be done thoughtfully and and in a timely way. And I feel like uh, I don't want to. It's not a zero sum. I don't want to not cut anything, and I don't want to cut everything. I think that what we were talking about originally, having the two items stay and the other things cut, is probably a good balance. Um, while some of the other items I think uh, we could do with, I think the other we could live with. Vice Mayor Combs. I respect everyone's opinion on this, so let's vote. Yeah, I, I'm. Where I am on it, guys, is look, I don't, the way this is going to play out is if it's a 3 2 vote on this, it's going to be three council members supported putting money toward expanding development while two councils voted. We're like, we want to go ahead and put that money in other areas. And I, I'm not, I don't think that's to anyone's benefit in the city. I'm just, I, I think actually what will end up happening here is that we're going to end up adding these people later on. And I think that that is, I don't think there's any way that we don't have having to add these people later, but I'm not going to be, I, I don't think it's like, it's going to end up happening anyway. So why, why take that? Why put us ourselves in that position? Like, well, I think what will end up happening is we're going to sit here right now. We're going to take it out of the budget. And then what's going to happen is two months from now, Deanna's going to say, we have a housing element. I need, I need people for, I can't get those other work done and we'll add them. And that's fine. I mean, the count, if the mayor and the vice mayor want to go in that direction, I'll support it. Councilmember Carlton. We are going to end up adding it back. And I, I just want to bring up, we need housing. We've all discussed this. We all know this. And we need to figure out and, and do it more thoughtfully. And we're going to need the staff to do it. It's not just development in one area or in one kind of development. You know, we've got all kinds of different programs uh, for people that want to do secondary dwellings. I just feel like it's a step backwards. And and we are going to end up adding it in. So we might as well do it now so that we're ready and we have the people uh, lined up and hopefully hired by then. Because the housing element is going to be huge. Uh, Council Member Nairish. I was just going to say, I think we should go ahead and take a vote. We'll be seeing this again in the next iteration of the budget and you know we can all reconsider if we change our mind so what, what i'd like to offer is a secondary alternative and that's that to leave the 156 on and then to offer half the budget now so it would be 184 185 and whatever na is those two uh those three aggregated and then split in half the dollar amount because I think we're going to end up having to take do dollar amount later, but that lets plan that lets our planning staff get started on work that will already needed to be done, but also takes into account the concerns of my colleagues that uh, they'd rather not be doing it at this time and wait. Is that a, is that a acceptable? I second that. Is that second? Is that acceptable? Secondary motion of my colleagues, the mayor and the vice mayor. I don't like it, but um, I, I will I, I will accept it um, for, for for the sake of, of of compromise and consensus. And thank I you. I do uh, thank you. I I do realize that this is not the this isn't the end. Um, this is a five 
council members having a discussion about uh, budget cuts. Um, but I, I still want to see the grants that are available to the city. Um, in all fairness to SB 330, it has nothing to do with affordable housing. It has to do with housing. Um, and people want more affordable housing. So we have lots of vacant units of housing now um, in District 1 um, because they're unaffordable. So um, That's it. It at has any rate. Would you, would you consider an abstention, Cecilia, until you get that information so you're not voting against it, but you're abstaining? Well, I, I don't have a problem either supporting it or not supporting it um, because okay. we, we have opportunity to change it. This isn't the, this isn't the final. I appreciate so. that. Okay, then I think we're ready to call a question. So, um, Council Member Mueller, if you could restate the motion, uh, just for the record, so the items we are leaving, please continue. So yeah, 183, 183 stays on the list, 184, 185, and re reduced long age planning, those budgets are half. So half comes off the list, half stays on. And we're also including um, the NA, which original reference number was 49, correct? Yeah, yes. Okay, so the motion as stated by Council Member Mueller, do I have a second? Question, is the uh, 600,000 part of the one half or is that being budgeted at full? Yes, that's part of the one half. Okay, so a second on the motion stated by Council Member Mueller. Thank you, Council Member Carlton. And by roll call vote, uh, Council Member Carlton. Aye. Council Member Mueller. Yes. Council Member Nash. No. Vice Mayor Combs. Yes. And Mayor Taylor. Yes. Okay. Motion passes with a Council Member Nash dissenting. Um, Dan, if you want to scroll down the list to our next items. So the first one up is 186. Is, is this the last one? The last slide for table 18? Uh, yes, Mayor Taylor, it is. Okay, this, I'm making this the, the last item because I, I really have hit the wall. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. And what I, can you repeat the dollar amount or maybe you never said it? Uh, I'm sorry, the dollar amount for, oh, the where, where uh, current, let's give me just a moment. We are currently tabulating them in the background. Looks like we're at 11.65 million currently. Thank you. Well, at least this is a short list. Why well, support keeping uh, 187 on the list? Just out of curiosity, the has the any of the language changed? Whether it went from eliminate to roll back or roll back to eliminate on either 186 or 187? Uh, I would have to check on that, Mayor Taylor. I'm not certain uh, okay. for that one. I, I believe this one did remain a roll back. Um, it was uh, staff augmentation added in recent years. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Nash. Thank you. Um, I'm curious why the um, I'm sorry, why 186 is tier three and what the sort of can you give me some information about that and why that's um, so important? 
Sure. So the accounting assistants do uh, a variety of tasks throughout the city. Um, they handle some of our revenue collection things, such as the UUT collections and business license administration. Um, they handle our payroll, they handle our accounts payable, um, and they uh, handle a number of administrative tasks within the admi administrative services department. Um, so it is important because it supports those functions and because it allows us to maintain the segregation of duties between the positions um, and so that we don't have cases such as uh, the same accounting assistant um, preparing uh, payables as well as paying the payables and allows us to, to make sure that we're not um, running into any financial difficulty in that sense. And it does allow redundancy too. So if multiple accounting assistants know how to process our payroll, uh, it means that they can take vacation. Thank you. Are there any follow-up questions, Vice Mayor Combs? I had a question was, um, can someone jog my memory as to why 186 and 187 were on the discuss list specifically? Um, was there one, you know, or a couple of issues that we want to follow up on about this? I do not remember. Council Member Mueller? I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw in the towel from the corner. Like, we're done, guys. Come on. I second that. Throw in the towel from the corner. I know staff is tired. I know we're tired. Like, oh, on this last two, can we just call the question and and cut these? Uh, so and I, and I don't even know what they are. are. That's that's the problem. Like right now, I can't, I don't even know what they are, and I don't even and I think everyone's so tired that we're just like. I think the decision making process is suffering. Like yeah, at some point you throw the towel in from the corner and you're just like, we'll pick it up on June on, on the, the the day of the hearing. Yeah, uh, Councilmember Carlton, I would normally agree with you, but 186 is a is a layoff. Um, and so if I'm reading it correct, and so if it were a freeze, I'd be fine. I'd be like, let's do this. But um, I I do want to make sure that like if we're talking about a layoff, we're 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 we're, we're sort of making sure we're we're you know, we're, we're definitely in, in the discussion. Yeah, thanks. I agree with that. Council Member Nash. Um, what were the other finance positions that we have um, frozen or laid off at this point? I thought that we had a number of positions that we had already discussed. Do you recall? Uh, uh, so Council Member Nash, within the uh, Administrative Services Department, there have been a number within finance, I believe only senior accountant was a uh, current position. A senior accountant has been, um, that position was laid off. What I'm wondering is how, um, for 186, actually 186 and 187, um, how many people do you currently have in um, accounting? I used to know that, but I don't off the top of my head right now. And how do how do the cuts that we've already made affect um, your ability to do this work, given that we are um, just where we are tonight? Um, so we'll require some redistribution. The senior accountant serves a supervisory role as well as doing some of the more complex work, whereas these positions that are on the screen now are some of the more support positions. So. Um, they will require some reshuffling of duties, and uh, generally speaking, those duties will accrue to higher level positions that uh, would otherwise not necessarily have been doing them um, in order to make sure that the work gets done. Or in some cases, um, for the case of um, 187 and 186 to an extent, um, the work just won't get done. So that would include um, process improvement initiatives, working on um, improving finance process and technologies. Um, and I, I would like to make one point of clarification. These are uh, all layoffs. One is a regular employee and two are temporary employees, but the uh, accounting assistant two position is, um, while it is filled, it is filled at a three quarter level. So it does include a quarter FTE vacancy. Could we leave that quarter vacancy as is? Does that reduce the budget implications if we do that? 
if we reduced it by a quarter FTE? Correct. Uh, yes, yeah, so it would represent a quarter of the number on the line there. On line 186, that is. And the reason why you were um, you were proposing that it goes to a full FTE? Uh, no, it's currently budgeted as a full FTE. It's just underfilled at three quarter level. So we could take 25% of that if we were to leave the position, if we were to take the position off the cut list, we could add back 25% and not affect any workload? Correct, from the current levels. Okay, at this point in the night, that's what I would recommend. I'm Was that a first and a second that I heard? Yeah. So we have a first by City Council Member Nash, a second by Combs uh, to adjust uh, reference number 186 uh, according to the 25% uh, FTE position. By roll call vote, City Council Member Carlton. Aye. City Council Member Mueller. Abstain. City Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Combs. Yes. Mayor Taylor. I don't do that that often. For clarity, we're only talking 186. Yeah. That is correct. Yes, then my vote is yes. The motion passes with Council Member Mueller abstaining. May we retire for the evening? Thank you. Thank wait, you. Wait, wait, wait. Did we we never voted on 187? Didn't you want to take that off the list? And can we do that really fast and then be done? Okay, I move that 187 comes off the list. Motion Thank on you. the floor by Council Member Nash to remove uh, reference number 187 from the list. Do I have a second? Is, is For clarity, is that the person that would be the layoff? I believe that would be two temp layoffs. And this is the one that was for open gov, which Mayor Taylor was um, spoke about initially and wanted. I believe. Yes. I don't even know. I, I, I'm not, I don't want to vote yes or no on it because I don't really know what it is. If, and if, we're not, if we're not going to take the time to really discuss this, I don't want to vote on it. I don't want to vote on something unless I'm, I'm really aware of what I'm doing. It, yeah, yeah, I, I think so supportive of that approach either because it's like it you know eliminating it returns it to baseline and i need to like want to understand a little bit more about what what baseline capacity is in this in this and so and i think again to earlier statements we were all sort of at our wall yes mr Piguero. thank you madam mayor i just would like to summarize uh the actions the council's taken this evening uh, we have sufficient, staff has sufficient direction to prepare a draft city manager's proposed budget for consideration by the city council on June 9th. Uh, thus far, the city council has reached consensus and taken action to direct the city manager to reduce the expenditure budget uh, by $11.7 million, which leaves a need for one-time money and or revenue of 1.8 million, and we will bring a recommendation uh, to you for that. Um, second, uh, the council has authorized, through the reductions that have been identified, the council has authorized a number of potential layoffs uh, that would require the city to issue a 45-day notice. Um, due to some of the changes that were made during the meeting, particularly in the police department and community, and, uh, and, uh, community services, I don't have the exact number of layoffs that are notices that would be issued for benefited or temporary employees, but we are seeking council's direction and authorization tonight to authorize staff to issue the layoffs. Authorize staff to issue the layoffs. It, 
on appearance, it looks like we're all done, Mr. Do we Figueroa. Have consensus for the notices? We do need an action from council if they wish us to issue the notices. So moved. I can't. I acclimation. I'm a no vote. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor by Council Member Carlton, a second by Vice Mayor Combs to um, authorize the issuance of layoff notices. Uh, Council Member Carlton, your vote. Carlton, your vote. Aye. Uh, to clarify, it's, we've already voted to to do this. This is just cleanup. Wait a second. I don't. No. no the, 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 Cecilia yeah, said yeah. she's not going to vote, and I'm. So guys, like, let's. I, I, once again, I, like. Let's no, I'm, sorry. I'm, calling, I'm calling the question. We we voted on it. We need to move on it. We we don't we, need to cut this wait, another. My under so guys, wait. My understanding because I'm probably going to vote no too because I'm not on board with what's going on with the police department. So when we did the police department, what you all all said to me was, well, it's not finalized tonight. We're going to vote it on June 9th. And I'm not on board with what we're doing with the police department. So my hope was between now and June 9th, we would be able to like, we would talk about it a little bit more. People would think about it a little bit more because by my calculation, the cuts are over 2 million bucks to the police department. So, you know, and it's a significant, it's like 13 or 14 employees in the police department of which eight are police officers. And you guys haven't, we haven't even discussed the use of reserves. And we haven't, I mean, we haven't discussed the UT. There's a lot we haven't discussed yet. And so, CIP. NCIP. So, like, if what was said earlier in the discussion was that we were going to not, it wasn't going to be finalized until the actual June 9th, that's not that I don't know. It's not that I'm saying we're not going to lay people off. It's just, are we going to be consistent with what we were saying earlier in the thing about why we weren't comparing things to each other while we went through the cuts? I, I, I was under the impression that we discussed the fact that we have 45 days from when we uh, do the notification to when they happen. And in those 45 days, a lot can happen. But every week that we don't make the cuts means that we're in the hole more and we have to make more cuts and we have to be more draconian. And I worry about keeping punting that ball and punting that ball. There's a 45 day lag between uh notification and when things actually happen and you're right i hope a lot of things happen that mean that we save jobs i sincerely do but meanwhile every week that we punt this it costs us more money and we have to make more cuts and that and that's the only reason i i push this forward um, yeah i would mayor, I, I apologize vice mayor comes uh, madam mayor the finance folks uh, have advised me that if we wait until June 9 uh, for t for direction on layoff notices, it will cost approximately two hundred thousand dollars. All right, well then I'll I'll vote on it. But I wish it's uh, I am voting. Uh, so how much minutes? I'm voting on this to move this forward, cuts forward. But I'm I'm really I once again not on board with what's happening with the police department. But I understand. That we have to do, uh, that we do have to take this vote now. Uh, so, please, sorry, please, 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 please be aware. I, I'm not happy about it either, and I hope this is a very uh, good call to action for them to come in and speak to us about alternative ways of of uh, addressing the issue. Yeah, I think that. Well, anyway, I don't think we need. To, I don't. I, you know, candidly. Like I said, I don't think we needed to go. I don't think that, so anyway, we can go back and look at that section of the tape earlier, but the, the, but anyway, that's fine. I already had said on um, just traffic, just cutting the traffic unit equal the amount of the COLA pretty close. So we went way past the COLA. But anyway, there's a first and a second, so Mayor, if you want to come Mayor, if you want to call a question. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Uh, Councilmember Nash, you had something you wanted to say. Everybody is so tired at this point and that we weren't able to hear exactly what is on the list, and I'm not sure we'd even understand it. Um, is there any chance we can revisit this like tomorrow morning, or that's too difficult to? 10:30, folks. Come on. 
Okay. Unfortunately, there is a 24 hour agenda noticing requirement for any special meeting. Okay, let's go then. Uh, I mean, yeah, Does I will. I'm having a meeting say, on Saturday. <laughs> I'm I'm supportive of this because we've already voted on the actions that that encompass the layoffs, and so I, I don't we sort of leave staff in the lurch if if we vote on the, the the sort of program cuts that include the layoffs and then not authorize the layoff notices at this point. I mean, what are we asking them to do? What I'm concerned about is there's been enough discrepancies between what we thought happened and what staff thought happened that to not have a on something as important as layoff notices. I am concerned that we don't um, that we have not seen a list to make sure. But given that we have 45 days to change these, I will go ahead. Okay, we have a motion, a motion by City Council Member Carlton and a second by Vice Mayor Combs. Uh, Council Member Carlton, your vote. Aye. Council Member Mueller. Yes. Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Combs. Yes. Mayor Taylor? No. The motion passes with Mayor Taylor dissenting. And just to say, can I ask just so the record's clear, was the issue that you wanted to wait until June 9th before you made your vote? Or what's the issue? Why it was the no vote? No, I, I didn't support uh, some of the layoffs. I voted no on an, on an item. Well, okay. I did, but I still had to, okay, anyway, okay. So that's, I mean, that that's the 1046 answer. Okay, I understand. Thank oh, you. Good night, all. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. See you soon.